I will become Hokage in one piece. Rodney transmigrates into the world of pirates with the addition of the Naruto system. He acquires various ninjutsu, teijutsu, genjutsu, bloodline limit, and the Sharingan. A dazzling array of ninja techniques shines brightly in this world as he completes missions, exchanges skills, and aims to become the Hokage. Chapter 1, Being Hokage in the Pirate World Do you want my treasure? If you want it, I can give it to you. Go find it. I put all the treasure there. These were the last words of G.O.L.D. Roger, the man who conquered the sea and was known as the Pirate King One Piece, before his execution, which marked the beginning of the turbulent era of the Great Pirates. The entire world was now entering the most chaotic and turbulent period. The era of the Great Pirates was marked by chaos. Even with the presence of a formidable organization like the Navy, it could only control the first half of the Grand Line. The New World had become the realm of pirates, and the Four Seas were also called the Paradise of Pirates. In the year 1517 according to the Sea Calendar, the East Blue had always been regarded as the weakest sea. Though referred to as the weakest, it gave birth to numerous ruthless individuals. Sabo, the second in command of the Revolutionary Army, and Luffy, the future Pirate King. Why dwell on weakness? Although East Blue is one of the Four Seas and is known for its peaceful and tranquil islands. But don't let its serene appearance fool you, as East Blue is also home to some of the most dangerous pirates and powerful marines. In addition, there is also a Sea King, who shows no mercy, nearly killing the future Pirate King and causing Shanks to give his left hand to protect Luffy. Furthermore, it was the hometown of the marine hero Garp. Garp often returned home to visit his relatives, and if he encountered pirates who didn't take kindly to him, he would deal with them easily. As a result, all the rising stars in the pirate world were shot down by him before they had a chance to shine. So, it's always the humans who shoot down the stars, Rodney silently complained, looking at the scar-faced man on the deck having a banquet with his crew, and sneered, the hacksaw pirates, led by the scar-faced Locke, with a bounty of 4.5 million bellies. Is that still considered a D-level task? But the task level is judged based on the level of danger, and this guy isn't that dangerous. I'll kill you today, he said as he picked up a wine barrel that was half the height of a person and walked forward. Oh, Jack. Is the wine coming? Scarface Locke, the leader of the Hacksaw Pirates, a cruel man known as Scarface Locke, asked. Just two days ago, they had raided a village. They made a fortune there, and when they left, they set the village on fire, leaving a large number of innocent villagers homeless. This was a bloodthirsty and heartless man. Rodney nodded and bowed, displaying obvious flattery on his face, Yes, Captain, this is your favorite rum. Let me pour it for you myself. Gah ha ha ha, you're sensible. Scarface Locke chuckled, his laughter sounding like a drake's, and he seemed pleased with Rodney's humble behavior. The pirates below rolled their eyes, looking down on Rodney's fawning behavior. Scarface Locke took the wine glass from Rodney's hand and gulped down the rum. Seeing that he had finished drinking, Rodney smiled and said to the other pirates, Everyone, everyone. Don't be dazed. This is a good wine that I just bought today. Scarface Locke chuckled and said, Jack is right, drink up, everyone. All the pirates then cheered and raised their glasses, laughing and drinking, looking happy. They were all excited about the huge amount of money they had plundered from the village. Rodney turned his head and looked at the flames in the distance, his eyes flickering with cold light. Ah, what a beautiful night, Scarface Locke said with a contented expression. Rodney nodded and said, Captain, if I may ask, why did you choose to be a pirate? You're such a talented person, if you were in the Marine, you would have been an admiral already. Scarface Locke laughed and said, Why be an admiral? Those guys are all fools. They think they're superior just because they wear a coat. But I want freedom. I want to be the king of this world, not a dog in the marine. Rodney frowned slightly and asked, But Captain, don't you think, the Pirate King is just a legend? Is it really possible for someone to conquer the sea? Scarface Locke sneered, Legend? Ha! Huh. The Pirate King G.O.L.D. Roger was a legend, and he proved that legends can become a reality. The One Piece, the treasure he left behind, is real. I will find it and become the Pirate King. That's my dream. Rodney's eyes flashed with a trace of hesitation, but he quickly concealed it and said, Captain, your dream is my dream. I will do my best to help you achieve it. Scarface Locke laughed heartily and patted Rodney on the shoulder, Good. That's what I want to hear. Together, 
we will conquer the world. As they spoke, the pirates around them began to sing and dance, celebrating their victory. The flames in the distance burned brighter and brighter, casting a flickering light on Rodney's face. In his heart, he silently made a vow. Captain, I will help you achieve your dream, but when the time is right, I will take everything from you, including the one piece. Seeing that everyone drank the wine, Rodney smiled, and Scarface Locke suddenly said, The wine is gone, Jack, go quickly, go quickly and bring me a few barrels, or I, um, what's going on? I can't move your body anymore. Scarface Locke was startled suddenly, he felt his body froze, his neck was limp and numb, and he also felt that his jaw was getting weaker, and when he looked at his subordinates, it was the same. With a rippling expression on his face, those who didn't know thought he was drunk. Jack? It's you. He was also a person who was wandering in the sea after all, so he immediately understood what was going on. Rodney smiled and said, I'm sorry, Scarface Locke, I got rid of this guy named Jack yesterday, and now it is estimated that he is in the stomach of the king of the sea, and he should merge with the seabed at night. Chapter 1.1, Being Hokage in the Pirate World, 2. Who the hell are you? Scarface Locke shouted, startled by the sudden turn of events. He couldn't believe that someone had managed to sneak on board his ship while they were out at sea. Haha, let me show you who I am, Rodney laughed, triggering a cloud of white smoke that enveloped him. As the smoke dissipated, a handsome young man, approximately 18 or 19 years old, stood before them. He had a slender build and a face devoid of scars. Unlike Locke and his crew, who were towering figures, he wore a jacket and open-toed blue sandals. A short sword was strapped to his thigh and a small cloth bag hung from his waist. Scarface Locke was taken aback by Rodney's true appearance. Rodney couldn't help but feel pleased. He had reached a point where he could be recognized just by his face. Who are you? Scarface Locke demanded. Rodney remained silent, realizing that there was no point in revealing his identity to a dying man. Scarface Locke spat a mouthful of thick phlegm at him in frustration, narrowly missing his target. What's the matter? Can't do anything? If you have the guts, let me go and see if I don't beat you to death. I'll show you the power of Scarface Locke. Scarface Locke taunted, his voice filled with arrogance. Rodney reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of kunau, a type of throwing kunau commonly used by ninjas. There's another way to deal with you. It's quite convenient. I don't even need to dirty my hands, Scarface Locke. I'll collect the 4.5 million bounty on your head. Scarface Locke's eyes widened in recognition. That weapon, are you the pirate hunter Joestar J. Rodney? Scarface Locke immediately recalled the rumors circulating at sea about a pirate hunter named Joestar J. Rodney, who hunted and killed pirates using unique weapons. The descriptions matched the man standing before him. Oh, so you've heard of me. Then there's no need for introductions. Scarface Locke, you're under arrest, Rodney declared, hurling a kunau that struck Scarface Locke's eye socket. Ah! Scarface Locke screamed, unable to defend himself. He could only watch his life slip away, but the anesthetic had rendered him numb, sparing him the pain. He was left speechless and helpless. A holographic display appeared before Rodney, visible only to him. Host, Joestar J. Rodney. Race, Human. Level, Ninja. Attributes, Wind, Fire, Water, Thunder, Earth, Yin, Yang. Ninjutsu. Fire Style, Fire Ball Jutsu, Fire Style, Phoenix Flower Jutsu, Water Release, Water Body, Chakra Extraction Technique, Earth Release, Earth Style Wall, Earth Release, Double Suicide Decapitation Technique, Medical Ninjutsu. Body Art. Shuriken Jutsu, Shadow of the Dancing Leaf, Leaf Whirlwind, Leaf Great Whirlwind, Eight Gates. Bloodline Limit, None. Mission Points. 260. Task, Kill Scarface Locke, Captain of the Scarface Pirates. Mission Level, D. Reward, 100 Mission Points. Status, Completed. 100 Mission Points were credited to Rodney. Without traversing, what was the Naruto system doing in the pirate world? Rodney recalled how he used to play Naruto games while watching One Piece, but in a fit of rage, he slammed his phone, causing it to explode and losing all his progress. But now, with the help of this golden finger and the Naruto system, he could acquire various powerful martial arts from the Naruto world by exchanging mission points. 
With his newly acquired wealth, Rodney left the village and embarked on his journey as a renowned pirate hunter. He aimed to become stronger, hunting down and eliminating the scoundrels who caused chaos in the seas, engaging in pillaging, killing, and plundering. Rodney saw a clear distinction between adventurers like the Straw Hat crew and true pirates. Pirates acted solely for their own desires, committing countless heinous acts. Rodney felt no psychological burden in taking them down. These scum waste the air while they're alive and pollute the sea when they die. They deserve to be eliminated, Rodney muttered to himself. Scarface Locke's bounty is 4.5 million, and with the first mate, second mate, and the rest of the crew, I can probably collect a total of 6 million. 6 million will be enough to purchase 30,000 detonating charms. In the Naruto world, an explosive tag costs 300 to 2,000 yen, equivalent to Belly's currency. With 30,000 pieces, Rodney could acquire a significant amount. Recalling the 600 billion explosive tag possessed by Conan, Rodney couldn't help but sigh. Money truly had limitless possibilities. It was clear to Rodney that he still desired wealth. He was the man who aspired to become Hokage. Hokage, I will definitely make it, Rodney affirmed, determined to achieve his goal. Chapter 2, Targeting the Flock Logue Town This town marked both the beginning and end. It was where the legendary pirate King Roger was born and died. The marines also had a presence here. The captain stationed in this town hailed from the marine headquarters and was known for his tremendous power. If one were to inquire casually, they would say that the newcomer far surpassed the previous corrupt branch captain who had conspired with pirates. A ship appeared on the horizon, catching the attention of the marine soldiers stationed at the port. They swiftly brought out their binoculars. If it were pirates, they would need to report immediately. However, what they saw was a familiar sight. A pirate's corpse hung from the bow and behind it stood a clean-cut man with a group of terrified pirates trembling before him. They were clearly frightened by the handsome man. It's Rodney. He's here to claim the bounties again, a marine soldier breathed a sigh of relief. Rodney was a rising star among pirate hunters and had a reputation for apprehending entire crews. Summon someone right away and prepare to receive the pirates. Yes, sir. Shortly after, the ship belonging to the Hacksaw Pirates docked, and a group of marines dispersed the crowd apprehending all the pirates. Leading the team was a graceful woman with glasses and a long knife at her waist, Master Chief Petty Office Tashiji. Mr. Rodney, Tashiji approached and greeted Rodney with utmost politeness. Hello, Tashiji. The hacksaw pirates are here. How much bounty can be collected? Rodney inquired. Tashiji smiled and replied, Please wait a moment. We need to calculate, but I assure you it won't be any less. She regarded Rodney with respect, acknowledging his contribution to the seas. Okay, Rodney nodded. He trusted Tashiji to be honest and was not afraid of any deceitful enrichment on Smoker's part. If he were to do the same, it would jeopardize the Marine's integrity. Soon, four stacks of banknotes fell into Rodney's hands, with one stack being relatively small. The entire Hacksaw Pirates crew had a total bounty of 5.63 million bellies. Rodney used 3 million bellies to purchase explosive tag and 10,000 bellies for shurikens and kunao blades, utilizing his savings. He found a hotel to rest and bought explosive tags, shurikens, senban, one, steel wires, and kunao from the system's marketplace. The system marketplace offered not only these items but also ninjutsu, taijutsu, bloodline limits, and more. However, acquiring them required mission points. The eight gates, white light chakra saber, Chakra extraction technique, and his own chakra were all granted by the system's gift package. Rodney could currently open only one gate of the eight gates, so he needed to continually train and strengthen his body to unlock more gates. The mission points and bellies in the marketplace were akin to points and diamonds in a game. The contrast was striking and felt somewhat familiar. However, this time, spending money was not an easy option. He placed a stack of explosive tags in his waste bag, along with a small collection of ninja tools. The waste bag had a cubic space, similar to a storage scroll, but the storage scrolls in the marketplace were too expensive and offered limited space. I'm broke again. Ding. A mission has been released. Just as he lamented his poverty, a new mission appeared. Rodney opened the mission details. Mission, eliminate the hundred crows. Mission level, C. Mission, kill Kuro. Reward, permanent chakra fruit, 150 mission points. Chakra fruit? That was a valuable item. 
the chakra fruit was not the one consumed by Kagaya Atsutsuki but a weaker variant. It came in two types, permanent and explosive. The permanent chakra fruit could increase one's chakra to a certain extent and expand their chakra capacity. On the other hand, the explosive chakra fruit provided a greater chakra boost than the permanent fruit, but its effects were temporary, disappearing after a certain duration. Dealing with Kuro wouldn't be an easy task. And was it too reckless to jump from a 4.5 million to 16 million bounties all at once? Kuro is a master strategist who has never once before failed in his village raids, he was the captain of the Black Cat Pirates. He feigned death to escape and infiltrated the wealthy merchants in Syrup Village trying to seize their properties. He was an incredibly intelligent individual, but unfortunately, he crossed paths with the great Usopp and Straw Hat Luffy. The current year in the sea calendar was the latter half of 1517, and he had spent nearly half a year in Kaya's house. That cunning fellow will pose some difficulties. It was inconvenient dealing with someone so intelligent, but not impossible. Rodney embarked on a new journey, following a merchant ship. Without sufficient navigation knowledge at sea, one could easily get lost in calm zones or encounter natural disasters. Unaware of these dangers, Rodney naturally trailed the merchant ship. The ship will pass through Syrup Village and also requires protection. The merchant ship made several stops for buying and selling goods, and the journey proceeded relatively smoothly. After receiving 50,000 bellies from the merchant ship's captain, Rodney sailed the boat toward Syrup Village. As the merchant ship could not dock directly, Rodney had to take a small boat north of Syrup Village. Syrup Village was a peaceful place, home to Yusop, the sniper of the red-haired pirates, and the father of Yusop, the sniper of the straw hat pirates. Trouble. Pirates are coming. Pirates are coming. Shouts echoed through the village, and the voice belonged to a young boy. Did they mistake him for a pirate? A cloud of dust appeared in the distance. Rodney focused his gaze and discovered a boy wearing a turban, boasting a long nose and an afro, frantically running ahead. Behind him, a group of adults brandished brooms and sticks, chasing after the boy with anger etched on their faces. You sob? The future sniper quickly slipped past Rodney, while the pursuing adults persisted. Rodney grabbed one of the adults and said, He's just a child. Can't you let him be? This happens every day, once or twice. It's really irritating. He truly takes after his pirate father. The villagers despised Usopp for his daily lies. It was one thing to scare them with tales, but doing it every day was plain annoying. Combined with Usopp's resentment towards his father becoming a pirate, such behavior was understandable. In the eyes of many, pirates were villains. Usopp's father, Yusopp, had accepted the invitation of the renowned red-haired Shanks to become a pirate. From the village's perspective, Yusopp was a scoundrel who had abandoned his wife and children especially after his wife's death. The villagers despised him and never wanted to see him again. To comfort his mother, Usopp began using the lie the pirates are coming every day when she fell ill, giving her hope. After his mother's passing, Usopp developed the habit of proclaiming the pirates are coming every day. He became known as a big liar, someone everyone disliked. Oh? Really? By the way, where is the wealthiest family in this village? Rodney inquired. The man pointed to a mansion atop the hill and asked, that's it? Wait, why do you ask? Rodney's appearance wasn't exactly that of a virtuous individual. I am a pirate hunter, and there's a pirate lurking in this village. Isn't that the brat from earlier? His father is a pirate too. No, that man isn't the pirate. Thank you. Rodney infused chakra into his legs and sprinted towards the hilltop villa, moving at a speed far surpassing that of an ordinary person. He vanished from sight in an instant. Could it be that the boy was a pirate? The man scratched his head, pondered for a moment, and asked a few people to follow. But how could they keep up with Rodney's speed? The distance wasn't far, so Rodney arrived at the backyard of the mansion and quietly slipped inside. This was the wealthiest family in Syrup Village and also the hiding place of Beiji Kiluo. Having realized the allure of being a pirate, Kuro faked his death and escaped, using one of his crew members as a decoy. With the help of the hypnotist Django the Turncoat, he had his subordinates believe that he was Claudor. He then orchestrated a situation where he was surrounded by the Marines and eliminated all the witnesses, leaving only a subordinate and a Marine officer to clear his name. Upon arriving in Syrup Village, he pretended to be a crew member expelled by the fleet and was taken in by this wealthy family, all while wearing a hypocritical mask that deceived everyone in the village. As a cunning and smart pirate, Kuro's actions were commendable, 
and his schemes were incredibly intricate. Rodney entered the garden adorned with flowers and plants, leaping onto a tree and concealing himself among the leaves. The mansion of a wealthy family was vast, making it a bit troublesome to find Kuro. Therefore, Rodney chose to observe from a distance. Chapter 3, Calculating Intelligent Individuals The gentle sea-scented breeze caressed Rodney's cheeks as the sun shone just right, making him feel a little drowsy. Rodney kept his gaze downward, as he saw a bespectacled man emerge, donning a black suit with a peculiar pattern, unique leather shoes, and neatly combed back hair that glistened in the sun. He wore a smile that gave off an unsettling vibe. Miss Kaya, it's a beautiful day today, said Kuro as he emerged from the back door. Following him, a fair-skinned girl with short, light blonde hair dressed in a white frock came out joyfully, exclaiming, Yes, the weather is splendid today. The girl's smile was sweet and charming. Rodney, perched on a tree, found the situation quite troublesome, as he didn't want the child to witness any violent scenes. Using his transformative abilities, he changed his appearance to that of Scarface Lock and leaped down directly. Kuro, who had been a pirate until a year ago, sensed the danger and swiftly escaped while holding Kaya. With remarkable agility, he reached the back door in an instant and smiled, saying, Miss Kaya, an unexpected guest has arrived today. Mary, please take care of her, he instructed the servant with a sheep-like haircut. Understood, Mary nodded and embraced Kaya. As he closed the door, Kuro pushed up his glasses with the palm of his hand a habit he had retained from his days as a pirate. Turning his gaze towards Rodney, he asked, Scarface Lock? What brings you here? The news of Syrup Village had been cut off, and word hadn't reached this place that Scarface Lock had been killed. Oh? I didn't expect the famous Kuro of a hundred plans to still be alive, and now working as a butler for a little girl. Tisk tisk, what a fall from grace. Kuro sneered coldly. He hadn't anticipated being recognized today. He had feigned his death that day and had come here with the intention of plotting Kaya's family assets. In his plan, Kaya couldn't die at this point. They were still useful to him. If they were to die now, his scheme to seize the family's wealth would go awry. I've made up my mind, and I no longer want to be a pirate, Kuro stated. I have nothing to do with you, and we have no quarrel. Why are you here, he inquired, his tone laced with curiosity. Rodney smiled and retorted, once a pirate, always a pirate. You can't change who you are. I'm here to lay claim to the possessions of these two individuals. Today, I'm going to eliminate the Kanaha whirlwind. With astonishing speed, Rodney delivered a powerful low kick to Kuro's head. Kuro, not one to be idle, had been a pirate himself, boasting a bounty of 16 million bellies. He was skilled in speed as well. He swiftly stepped back, evading the attack with a few leaps. Rodney thought to himself, Sheesh, this guy is way too agile, isn't he? Suddenly, hurried footsteps approached, and a group of bodyguards armed with guns and batons rushed over. Rodney smirked, leaped onto the roof, and let out a hearty laugh. Kuro, I'll give you an hour. If you don't come out, I'll make sure your name echoes throughout East Blue. Trust me, I have the ability to do so. The folks at the Eastern Post Office would love to hear this sensational news, he declared. I've even come up with a name for the newspaper, shocked. The fake death and retirement of Kuro of a hundred plans, haha. <laughs> I'll be waiting for you in the northern forest. You have just an hour. With that, he descended from the roof and headed toward the forest. Inside Kuro's room, upon hearing Rodney's words, his expression turned grim. He had worked hard to gain the trust of Kaya's parents, to get closer to Kaya, and to blend in with the villagers. In retrospect, he found these actions foolish. All of it was for the sole purpose of seizing Kaya's family assets. He knew that being a pirate and stealing money was illegal, but being a wealthy person and doing the same was considered legal. Thus, he endured the humiliation and shouldered the burden, all for the immense family fortune. Now, Rodney's unexpected arrival had disrupted his plans. He had to find a way to rectify this deviation and get his scheme back on track. He retrieved a package from under the bed, containing the weapon he was renowned for Cat's Claw. Wearing the Cat's Claw, he lightly moved his ten fingers, causing the sharp blades on each finger to glisten ominously. These blades could tear flesh and hair apart, perfecting his plan once again. Pushing up his glasses with his furry palm, a habit that lingered from his days with this weapon, Kuro maintained his vigilance and fighting instinct, even after several years of not using it. Pushing open the window and finding no one around, 
he immediately leaped out and dashed toward the eastern forest at full speed. Recalling the information about Scarface Lock, his mind raced. This pirate with a bounty of 4.5 million was skilled in cutting enemies in half with a hacksaw. He possessed immense strength and was known for his foul language. A hacksaw, a hacksaw. He abruptly stopped. The Scarface Lock he had encountered just now was peculiar. Why hadn't he seen his weapon? And why did a pirate with a mere 4.5 million bounty threaten him instead of escaping? He hadn't heard that Scarface Lock excelled at attacking enemies with his legs either. Kuro had stumbled upon numerous blind spots. There must be traps in the forest, but if I don't go. Rodney had set a trap for Kuro, and it was up to Kuro whether to take the bait. Either way, traps would undoubtedly be waiting for him. If he didn't show up, he would have to deal with the arrival of the Marines. For the sake of his own plan, Kuro found himself being manipulated by the other party. This thought angered him. Who was he? He was the illustrious Kuro, and he would never allow himself to be caught by anyone. This indignation fueled his determination. Damn it, I have to kill that bastard. If only Django were here, but unfortunately, he will never appear because of my own orders. The eastern forest wasn't far away. Kuro showcased his expertise, moving silently and stealthily as if he were a cat on the prowl. Occasionally, the forest echoed with the songs of birds, and the sunlight streamed through the gaps in the leaves, casting scattered patches of light on the grass, creating a delightful sight. Scarface Lock, here I come. With no one in sight and the silence feeling eerie, Kuro decided to break it. Just in time. Ding. Ding. A metallic clash reverberated through the air, and Kuro swiftly turned his body to dodge a shuriken hurtling towards him. No, there were two sounds just now. Sensing something amiss, he felt a sharp pain in his back as two shurikens pierced into it, with one lodging itself in a nearby tree trunk. The shurikenjutsu was an effective method of altering the trajectory of shurikens in midair by utilizing the impact of another shuriken. Ding! Ding! The sound repeated, Kuro brandished his cat's claw, deflecting the shurikens. In a flash, he lunged towards a tree, swiftly slicing off its crown, causing a figure to be propelled out. Fire style! Fireball Jutsu. An enormous fireball, the size of a house, materialized out of thin air and hurtled toward Kuro. Kuro promptly leaped onto the tree trunk he had recently dismembered, propelling himself backward. The fireball collided with the tree, setting it ablaze. The intense heat generated by the chakra-infused flames quickly reduced the tree to charcoal. This power is truly fearsome. Could this person be a devil fruit user? Kuro muttered, refusing to back down. Rodney crashed to the ground, confirming Kuro's suspicion. Silent step. Upon seeing Rodney reappear, Kuro resolved to make a move. Kuro's speed was extraordinary. When he reappeared, he was already behind Rodney. With the cat's claw aimed at the back of Rodney's neck, one swift strike would sever the man's head. Substitution technique. I've got you. With a swipe of his paw, Kuro effortlessly tore Rodney's body apart only to have him transform into a wooden stake and be shredded into pieces. What? All right, the game is over. Earth release, double suicide decapitation technique. A hand emerged from the ground, gripping Kuro's ankle tightly. Exerting force, Rodney pulled Kuro into the soil. Shortly after, Rodney emerged covered in dirt, shaking off the debris. Kuro's body had vanished beneath the ground, and the surrounding soil was stained red with blood. By deliberately calculating and unintentionally luring Kuro into the soil, Rodney had curbed his opponent's exceptional speed, causing him to perish without even using his special abilities. I should find a place to clean up and change my clothes. Reverting to his appearance, he made his way back to the village. Chapter 4, Eating the Old Man's Punch First After taking a shower, Rodney feels relaxed. His long black hair is wet and drooping, and in his hand, there's a dark red ball the size of lychee the permanent chakra fruit. It's very similar to the chakra fruit made by the Atsutsuki clan, well, it should be about the same. He stuffs it directly into his mouth, and without chewing, he swallows it. He have eaten it once before, and the taste was not very pleasant. It should be better than the taste of a devil fruit. Eating the chakra fruit feels like eating canned herring while eating a devil fruit tastes like shit. This old eights, one, system, cough cough. The chakra fruit melts in his mouth, replenishing the chakra consumed in battle and increasing his overall chakra. If the amount of his chakra is equivalent to 0.5 Kakashi, 
then it is 0.8 Kakashi now. As we all know, Kakashi is the unit of measurement for chakra. TL slash N, it's not, lol. Chakra is the physical energy in every cell of the human body and its own spiritual energy, which is then released as ninjutsu through hand seals. I feel stronger now. Of course, it's just an illusion, as there are many people stronger than me. The only thing that made him unhappy is that Kuro faked his death. Even if he was brought to the marine, he would not be able to redeem the bounty because his bounty order had been withdrawn, and he is recorded as dead. Opening the mall, he now has 510 mission points and he can finally redeem the things he has always wanted. Mutually multiplying explosive tags redemption required, 500 mission points. Mutually multiplying explosive tags, a forbidden technique, a level infinite blasting ninjutsu developed by the second Hokage, uses detonation talismans to infinitely channel more than a few hundred million explosive tags to trigger a series of explosions. Only one talisman is needed to make the enemy unable to get rid of it. The premise is that if you have enough detonators. This is also the reason why it is so cheap even though it is an A-level forbidden technique. But the power is still considerable, as long as there are enough explosive tags, unlimited bombing can be achieved. Originally, it was a ninjutsu that was matched with the Earth Release Resurrection technique, corpse soil, but he can replace it with a water body. He only needs to stick one on the enemy's body to complete the bombing and killing. Considering the physical strength of the people in this world, he is afraid that a large number of explosive tags are needed, and if he enters the new world where everyone is domineering, the practicality of this forbidden technique is not too great. At least in East Blue and the first half of the Grand Line, it is considered a powerful skill. After exchanging mutually multiplying explosive tags, the method of use and the corresponding hand techniques immediately appeared in Rodney's mind. Because it is a ninjutsu developed by the second Hokage, it is mainly practical and fast and only needs hand seals and the corresponding chakra to be activated, with very low chakra consumption. But every explosive tag requires chakra, making it a continuous consumption ninjutsu. What is consumed is not only chakra but also money. After having a meal on the island, Rodney heard the news that Kaya's housekeeper, Claudor, was kidnapped by pirates. The hotel owner was still lamenting the tragic experience of that good old man. In terms of acting, Kuro can win the Best Actor Award. It's a pity that there is always someone stronger than him. The next ninjutsu to be exchanged will be Let Me See. Yes. Seeing that the next ninjutsu requires 5,000 quest points, it's too expensive for Rodney's liking. Forget it, I'll think about it later. Without a mission, Rodney decided to leave the island. Syrup Village was too small, and the pace of life was slow. It would be better to go to a big city like Logue Town to take a break. The boat left Syrup Village, rowing through the waves, and floating along the current, even though Rodney didn't know the exact direction. There was enough food on board. He had military rations pill in his backpack, priced at 1,000 bellies each, providing basic energy for a day. If he wanted to indulge a bit, he could have a bowl of ramen for 2,000 bellies. It would fill his stomach, speed up his chakra recovery, and it tasted good as well. Water wasn't a concern as Rodney possessed the water release chakra, allowing him to produce fresh water to replenish his body. Unfortunately, the system stated that chakra produced water couldn't affect devil fruit users' weakness to sea water. But it was still a good source of water for personal use. Using sea water in his escape would weaken the effect on devil fruit users due to the chakra it contained, reducing the weakening effect of the sea. Instead of completely losing their strength, the users would only be weakened. If he were lucky, they might lose their abilities, but their physical strength would still remain. Originally, Rodney planned to directly confront a devil fruit user and douse them with a large amount of water. However, the system poured cold water into his plan. As the boat rocked on the sea, Rodney held up the sun umbrella, wearing sunglasses to shield himself from the sun and preserve his moisture. After floating on the sea for a while, a gigantic monster emerged from the depths and leaped out of the water. The creature was over 20 meters long, with the head of a rhinoceros and a body covered in blue scales. It was a sea beast a sea king. Roar. The sea king roared loudly at Rodney, showcasing its strength. Why are you shouting so loudly? Rodney took off his sunglasses, stepped out of the boat, walked on water, and dashed toward the sea king. Oh. The sea king had never seen a human running on water before, but in its eyes, Rodney was nothing more than a snack. It opened its mouth and prepared to bite. Shadow of the dancing leaf. Rodney delivered a powerful kick to the sea king's chin sending it flying backward and creating a wave in its wake. 
Rodney himself was riding the waves up and down. Not today, my friend. Sea kings possessed a certain level of intelligence. Their strategies were cunning and they could change tactics on the fly. However, it was unfortunate for the sea king to encounter Rodney it was too late to escape. Hey, here comes some free labor. Soon after, a wire was tied around the horn of the sea king, and the other end of the wire was tied to the bow of Rodney's boat. The boat immediately gained speed and became Rodney's pulling tool. Sea kings were incredibly fast in the sea, and those in the East Blue were particularly easy to bully. Rodney wondered how that red-haired guy lost an arm. Riding the wind and waves, as long as the Sea King tried to drag him into the sea, it would be severely beaten. Naturally, the well-trained Sea King wouldn't dare to attempt that again and instead was asked to take Rodney to the nearest island. Damn human! When I become stronger, I'll definitely eat you. Enduring the pain, tears welling in its eyes, the Sea King continued to move forward with determination. Due to the excessive speed, Rodney experienced the thrill of a roller coaster. He flew up, then fell, flew up again, and fell once more, and it continued like that. Bastard, slow down. The pursuing Sea King threw something at Rodney's head, causing some minor pain. Whoosh. This was the Sea King's way of bullying. Slowly, a ship appeared quickly ahead. The Sea King paid no attention and charged directly at it. Rodney didn't mind after teaching the Sea King a lesson. He lay down and enjoyed the moment. Boom. Waves splashed all around. Boom. Another wave. A small black dot enlarged in front of Rodney's eyes it was a cannonball. Rodney. Oh my god. The cannonball flew past him, piercing through the bottom of the ship behind him. Sea water gushed in. Rodney. Making a quick decision, Rodney jumped out of the boat and approached the Sea King. In front of him was a warship. Rodney. He stepped on the Sea King's head. You bastard. What have you done? The Sea King whimpered a few times. It hadn't done anything, it just approached the warship. Rodney saw an old man with a strong presence on the ship's side. He wore a cloak of justice and held a cannonball in his hand, ready to throw it at him. It was clear that the old man possessed incredible arm strength, as the speed of the shell matched that of a fired bullet. And the target was Rodney himself. How did he end up meeting this old man? It seemed like the old man mistook him for a pirate. Dodging the shells, Rodney noticed more and more projectiles flying toward him. Fire release, Phoenix Sage fire technique. Small fireballs flew out, colliding with the shells and causing explosions. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Rodney stepped on the water and jumped onto the warship a few times. Stop. I'm not a pirate. Hey. The young lad should first experience the old man's punch. Bang. Chapter 5, Will You Join the Marines? ha ha ha, I'm sorry, sorry. The old man received a report from his subordinates and thought you were a pirate, ha ha ha. Are you okay? The tall and mighty old man laughed and patted Rodney on the back with a big palm. Once or twice. Puff. Vice Admiral Garp, please don't shoot any more. Mr. Joestar vomited blood, the medical soldier said loudly. The marine hero Garp laughed embarrassingly. This is not acceptable. How can a man's body be so weak? How can he swim in the sea like this? Who will support your slap? Rodney wiped away the blood stains from his mouth. His body was already considered strong, and he survived Garp's punch. He is not dead. You know, back then, the old man beat the pirate King Roger with a pair of fists, as Roger escapes from him around in the sea. Garp said that he has always convinced people with virtue, and by the way, his fist is called the fist of love. With the bag on his head, he felt the same pain as the Sea King just now. The green light lit up on the palm of his hand, and the healing technique was immediately applied to his wound, stimulating the cells on the big bag and speeding up recovery. Hey? It's a very strange ability. Are you a devil fruit user? That's right. Rubbing his head, he said vaguely. Ha ha ha, what a great ability. Can it be used on others? Garp asked interestedly. Yes. Garp heard the words, his eyes lit up, and said, Boy, what's your name? Joestar J. Rodney. Haha, <laughs> I'll call you Rodney. Rodney, come join the Marine. Ding. Garp sent you an invitation. Do you agree? Sorry, I don't want to be in the Marine. Rodney rejected Garp's invitation. Garp asked puzzledly, Why? 
your ability can make many marines speed up their recovery from injuries. Wouldn't it be good to contribute to justice? No, the marine is too troublesome. I think my life is good now. The marine is too complicated, and there is a group of scum like the world government and the celestial dragons. He doesn't want to be called around by those scums. The so-called justice is dragged down by a group of people, it is better not to participate, so as not to suffer from that burden. The old man thinks that you are very suitable to be an excellent marine, but your body is too weak and needs to be practiced. Under the old man's hands, you will definitely grow. Garp laughed. Farewell, goodbye. Rodney turned around and left after hearing this. He is not Luffy who has such a strong vitality. If he is trained by Garp, he will die, he will definitely die. A pair of big hands full of calluses grabbed his shoulders, and the old man smiled kindly and said, Boy you will definitely thank me next time. No. Help. Garp seemed determined, dragging Rodney to training. For Garp, Rodney's ability is very useful, and it seems to be a diamond in the rough that can be developed. He wants to give it a try and let him join the Marines. Another point is that he is very bored on the warship. Give more strength, Rodney boy, hold on. Garp bit a donut and sat on the back of Rodney, who was wearing an iron suit and doing push UPS. This was the third day of Garp's training. Rodney was dragged into high-intensity physical training every day. He was as tired as a dead dog, but it was also beneficial. His body was also growing at a very rapid rate. Chakra is also depleting at a very fast rate. The sweat on his body was like rain, dripping on the deck. The chakra in his body was constantly squeezed, and his body became heavier and heavier. The iron suit on his body weighs a thousand caddies, one, and Garp is tall and burly. If it weren't for his good physique, his chakra might not be able to hold it up. Ah, no more. He fell on the deck, and Garp asked, how many did you do? The marine soldier who had been recording on one side said, 4, 320, 400 more than before. Physical growth is growing very fast. No. This is not possible. How can he grow into an excellent marine? Garp shook his head and said, I didn't say I would become a marine. I'm a pirate hunter, not a marine. Why do I have to join the marine? He took off his iron clothes, revealing his muscular upper body. Garp, he has trained his hacky to the strongest level in the world. Even without hacky, hitting people is still painful. Even the rubber man Luffy, who is immune to blunt blows, can feel the excruciating pain. What are you talking about? Your ability is very suitable for becoming a marine, whether you are a medical soldier or a full-time marine. Don't waste your talent. Garp has also noticed it these days. At first, he just thought that this kid's physique is too poor, as a reward for accidentally injuring him, he trained him. But Rodney's display of healing skills and strong growth rate made him love the talent. But this kid seems to be as stubborn as his grandson, obsessed with being a pirate hunter. What's so good about being a pirate hunter? Have you been corrupted by money? Of course. Money is not everything, but without money, it is absolutely impossible. Vulgar. Being a marine also has a salary. Come on, I'll get rid of a pirate on the arrest warrant easily. The marine includes food and housing, five social insurances, and one housing fund. Sorry, I'm at home everywhere, and I'm not afraid of hardships and dangers. Hey, old man, you hit me again. I think you need education, old man. Garp's fists crackled. Re-education through labor. Special education. Why? I haven't done anything wrong. Rodney said, sticking out his neck. Dare to talk back, find a fight. Crackling. On the deck, Garp chased Rodney up and down, and Rodney didn't look overworked at all. Boom. He punched Rodney into the deck, which aroused the dissatisfaction of the shipbuilder. It is very troublesome to repair such a big hole. Buhahaha, Rodney boy. It seems that the training these few days has allowed you to take a punch from this old man. The punch was not at all his full strength. If he had done his best, Rodney would be gone. Is it? Fist of love? Presumably, perhaps, the power of fist of love is not there either. Humph, old man, even if I die and lie in a coffin, I will use my rotten vocal cords to shout, I will never become a marine. Rodney got up, his nose bruised and his face swollen. Smelly boy. Do you like money that much? Of course. I'm a pirate hunter, and I travel around the sea for money. 
Rodney said while healing his injuries. Then, I'll hire you to help this old man catch someone. Okay, the training method of Haki, or the Rokushiki, too, dot. You really dare to open your mouth like a lion, three, dot. Garp rolled up his sleeves, his muscles knotted. His arm exuded a particularly frightening power. Of course, the person you asked me to arrest is definitely not easy to deal with, so the reward I want is not high. Rodney showed a fox-like smile. Garp scolded with a smile, you are really a chicken thief, four. Your current body can't learn hacky. If you have Rokushiki, I can give you one move first, and then I can give you two moves after you catch someone. Well, who do you want me to catch? The old man's grandson, Ace. Who? Your grandson? Where is he now? He didn't expect Garp to ask him to catch Ace. Didn't his grandson go to sea? That kid went to sea three months ago, but he still became a pirate instead of a marine. I'm really mad at this grandson of mine. It's estimated that he's about to reach Reverse Mountain. Boy, I hope you can help this old man take care of his lovely grandson. Get him back. Garp understands that with Ace's ability, he will definitely make a name for himself at sea. When he reaches a certain level, he will easily become a target of the world government. Once the identity of Roger's son is discovered, there is no possibility of his survival. The world government will not allow the blood of evil to live in the world. It is absolutely not impossible for Ace to be investigated by the world government, but Garp doesn't want to hinder his grandson's dream, and he will definitely be merciful if he is captured by himself, so he will leave it to this kid. The people under his command brought Rodney's information, and every time he caught a pirate, he even captured their ship. He was not merciful to the pirates but very gentle to ordinary people. He was a man with justice in his heart, but money clouded his judgment. It's a pity that such a man is not in the Marines. Chapter 6, I'm So Fortunate Ding! Triggering a side mission. The system, with no sense of existence, suddenly activated and released the mission. Well? Are there any side quests? Mission, Capture the Pirate Poor Gas D Ace Level, C Rewards, Majestic Destroyer Flame, Sharingan, 800, Mission Points This mission is a side mission. You can refuse it. Do you want to refuse? Wow! Rodney gasped upon seeing this reward. Not only does it offer the fire escape Huohuoquin, but also the Sharingan. If he exchange it for mission points, it would be worth 3000 points. The reward Sharingan is a must accept task. Okay, I accept it, but since it's your grandson, I need Sea Stone as insurance. What if Ace has eaten the flame flame fruit at this point? Nature is unpredictable. How will he deal with it? Greedy brat! The old man has never used sea stone. This time I am on vacation. Where would I get sea stone from? Besides, I don't need it to deal with Ace, right? Garp said. Judging from his reaction, Ace hasn't eaten the flame flame fruit yet, and Ace didn't show any signs of eating the flame flame fruit in the original book, so it should be okay to proceed. Do you have his Viva card, one? Rodney asked. If I have it, does the old man still need you? That makes sense. Rodney sighed and said, Okay, I will find a way to catch him. This task must be completed. Sharingan and Madara's best fire technique. Speaking of such a reward, is it only AC rank? Which one of the Rokushiki are you going to teach me? Well, let's start with Shave. The old man will teach you, but it's up to you whether you can learn it or not. Next, Rodney's miserable life continued. Half a month later, Rodney in Logue Town, walked along the street wearing the clothes of a Marine soldier. He hadn't officially joined the Marines, but he lost all his clothes and could only wear what was available on the ship. I was fortunate to meet Garp, but it was also a bit unfortunate. Is it karma for bullying the Sea King? Although he learned shave, it would still take some time to master it. Garp's hell-style training greatly improved his physique, and he could now open the second door of the eight gates. Then, he asked Garp for a small boat caught another sea king, and accelerated his journey. It took a week to reach Logue Town. The main reason was that Garp's route was opposite to his. He was heading from Syrup Village to Logue Town, while Garp was going from Logue Town to the Goa Kingdom. The routes were completely opposite. So he changed several sea kings and finally arrived in Logue Town incognito. The system had its own tracking capabilities. Ace hadn't left East Blue and was heading towards Logue Town, 
so Rodney just needed to wait there. Mr. Joestar. Hearing someone call his name, he turned his head and found it was Tashiji. Master Chief Petty Officer, what's going on? Were you in a hurry? We received a report that someone was eating a king's meal at Uncle Frank's restaurant. It's a pirate, so I'll handle it. You go, Tashiji led the team and left after speaking. Who could it be? How dare they eat a free meal in Logue Town? They must be quite bold. Rodney planned to follow along and join in the excitement. It's human nature to be curious and eager for excitement. It's deeply ingrained in Rodney's DNA and can't be changed. On the main street of Logue Town, a group of people was running wildly. One of them wore an orange cowboy hat. The captain fell asleep again, so we have no money, said a man with a gun. It's normal for the captain to eat and sleep, and we always eat extravagant meals. It's the captain's habit, replied a man with blue hair. Glancing at the pursuers behind them, the man in the hat said, hurry up. The marines are coming. Run. We'll reach the harbor soon. Sorry, this road is blocked. Thanks to his training with Garp, Rodney's speed had greatly increased. He passed the crowd and reached their front. Who? Get out of the way. One of the fat men bumped into him directly, and Rodney jumped up and punched him in the forehead. Bill. Rodney looked at his fist and felt an exhilarating sensation. Marine, get out of the way. The man with the gun immediately fired a shot at him. Rodney swiftly dodged the bullet, jumped, and quickly approached the group knocking down one of them with a punch. Shadow of the Dancing Leaf Leaf Whirlwind Leaf Great Whirlwind He kicked the last person repeatedly, but as he was about to kick the next person, his leg was grabbed by a hand. I'm sorry, I can't let you bully my crew anymore, said a freckled young man with a burning palm. Surprised, Rodney quickly backed away, only to see flames burning on the opponent's palm. A Logia Devil Fruit user with fire abilities. Rodney's face darkened. He didn't expect to encounter the target so soon, and he didn't anticipate that Ace had already consumed the flame flame devil fruit. Poor gas D Ace. Sorry, just woke up. Deuce, how are you doing? Ace asked the blue-haired young man beside him. Mask Deuce, the ship doctor of the Spade Pirates. It's just a minor injury, but it'll take at least three hours to wake up, Deuce replied calmly. Then it's fine. Everyone. Take the unconscious person back to the ship. Leave this to me, Ace said, looking at Rodney seriously. But Rodney didn't care about Ace's crew. His task was to bring Ace to see Garp. Be careful, Captain, Deuce said, believing in Ace's strength and not worried that he would be defeated here. Logia Devil Fruit's abilities are ineffective in the first half of the Grand Line, so there is no need to worry about what will happen to Ace. They would only cause trouble for Ace here. Poor Gas D Ace. Your grandfather asked me to capture you and bring you back. Let's do this without a fight. Luckily, the tracking system indicated that Ace had been here a few days ago. Rodney didn't expect him to arrive in Logue Town so soon. No, I won't go back. I don't want to see the old man. Ace shouted, You can't stop me. Fire fist. Ace's arm transformed into a pillar of fire and rushed towards Rodney. Earth release, Earth style wall. Similar to Kakashi, Rodney had also engraved dog heads on the earth-style wall, making it an unpretentious wall. The pillar of fire hit the earth-style wall and destroyed it. You coward. You resorted to a sneak attack. Ace's headless body staggered back, horrifyingly, as flames erupted, and his head reappeared. No Haki, the Logia-type devil fruit is truly insurmountable. No wonder Haki was introduced later on, Rodney muttered to himself, feeling the numbness in his hands. How could he fight this? This guy is clearly immune to fire attacks, and Rodney didn't have any usable attack methods at the moment. The explosive tag would only have a delaying effect, and he would regenerate after being detonated. Seeing that Rodney didn't attack again, Ace smiled and said, Step aside, you can't beat me. He may not be able to beat you, but I can. White snake. White smoke billowed out, and at the forefront was a gloved fist that struck Ace. Ace leaped to avoid the punch and landed on a nearby house. He saw a white man approaching, his right arm constantly emitting smoke, with a silver back, wearing a white motorcycle suit that showcased his well-built muscles. On his back was the word justice, with a cigar in his mouth and a fierce expression on his face. He looked more like a pirate than a marine. Smoker, a captain of the marine headquarters. Oh, 
you arrived just in time, Captain Smoker. Vive Admiral Garp asked me to bring his grandson back. Please lend me a hand, Rodney said. Vice Admiral Garp's grandson. Smoker was momentarily taken aback, then snorted coldly. Even Vice Admiral Garp's grandson should be taken to prison. He can't be handed over to him. Rodney shrugged, knowing that Smoker was a strict man, and said, Then capture him first, and we can discuss it later. Smoker had hacky infused rings on his fingers, which were the nemesis of Devil Fruit users. Chapter 7 Fire Fist Ace I absolutely won't. Absolutely won't. I will never go back to see that old man with you. Ace retorted loudly. That's none of my business. My mission is to take you back. Lieutenant General Garp paid me, Rodney said, moving his body. The natural department is really troublesome. I'll cover you as Colonel Smoker. With more Kunao and Shuriken in his hand, he threw them directly at Ace. Fire gun. Ace's index and middle fingers of both hands pointed at the two of them like guns and small fireballs spewed out from his fingertips, shooting at the two of them. Rodney jumped up, pirouetted, and kicked Ace's upper body with a steel whip-like leg. How many times have I said, stop fighting in the downtown area? Tashiji, you guys arrange for the townspeople to evacuate the scene, Smoker smoked a cigar and asked Tashiji to evacuate all the people around him from the battle site. For a while, a large number of townspeople fled when they heard that someone was fighting there, and they didn't care about their shops or homes. It's nonsensical. The battle between the marine and the pirates can easily cost lives and cause significant damage. Rodney is not domineering, and his kicks are of no use to Ace, let alone dodge. The flame formed Ace's upper body, and he said, it's really a powerful attack method. Maybe you should consider joining my crew. Rodney's face darkened. Why are the two brothers alike? Bastard, don't recruit pirates in front of me. Smoker stepped on the ground and disappeared. Rokushiki shaved. His hand slammed towards Ace. Sensing the threat, Ace didn't elementalize but dodged. It's so dangerous. Hey? What is this? Suddenly, there was a kunau at his feet, and an explosive tag was tied to the kunau. Flames suddenly appeared from the explosive tag, and with a bang, Ace's body was blown away, not even his head remained. The flames burned, and Ace reappeared with a solemn expression and said, It seems that you are not an ordinary marine. I am a pirate hunter. It's just that I have been out of clothes recently. Smoker snorted coldly and said, Rodney, don't waste time, grab him. Rodney clamped six kunau between his fingers, each with an explosive tag tied to them. Then he threw them at Ace and took out a shuriken from his pocket, trying to hit each other in turn and change the flight trajectory of the kunau to avoid being destroyed by Ace's flames. Boom 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 boom. Explosions occurred, stirring up a lot of smoke and dust. A ball of flame rushed out of the smoke, forming Ace's appearance. He lowered the brim of his hat in midair and laughed, My crew is still waiting for me. Let's go first. Boy, do you want to run? Smoker used shave to approach Ace immediately. Ace was startled and waved his hand. The flames swallowed Smoker, but he smashed through the flames with ten hands and struck Ace, who was caught off guard, causing him to crash into a house. It hurts, it hurts. What's going on? I couldn't elementalize just now. Getting up from the ruins, Ace had a few scratches on his body, but nothing serious. As expected of a child raised by Garp, it's no wonder he has survived until now. By the way, how long have you had this ability? Rodney asked. Ace patted the ashes on his body and replied without thinking, I got it two days ago. Rodney. No wonder he doesn't use much power. He hasn't fully developed his abilities yet. He's still new to them right? Very well, it will be very troublesome for me to deal with you once you become more experienced. Smoker took a deep puff of his cigarette. The two cigars in his mouth quickly turned into small cigarette butts. He drew two new cigars from his body, stuffed them into his mouth, and lit them with the remaining two butts. Sip it, suck it, and reignite it. He looked like an old smoker. Marine, you're really troublesome. Ace pressed his hat down. He won't give in easily. I will be the one to find one piece in the future. I won't stop here. However, Ace's dream remained unchanged. One piece? What a boring dream. The last person who pursued one piece died here, Smoker said. Ace's previously relaxed expression suddenly changed, and he roared, who died here like that guy? 
I will definitely find one piece and live a better life than him. He had a deep hatred for his pirate king father and felt disgusted when others mentioned him. I don't care about that. I'm just responsible for bringing you back to Vice Admiral Garp. After that, you can stay or run. I have nothing to do with your reign, Rodney said, feeling helpless. Facing Logia-type devil fruit, he was at a disadvantage when everyone else was fighting. A tiger bites a hedgehog and has no place to bite its teeth. 1. On the other hand, Smoker said, Captain Smoker, lend me your hands. Smoker glanced at him but said nothing. The meaning was already clear, don't even think about it. Rodney, who faced a setback, sighed, and Ace asked, what benefits did that old man give you? Half of the Rokushiki and the knowledge of how to cultivate Haki, Rodney laughed. Ace, don't underestimate your old man. He was a formidable man who chased after Roger all over the sea. It's only because you're his grandson that he indulged you all the time. Garp is a man worthy of the justice he stands for, but justice can be a stumbling block. He watched his beloved grandson die in front of his eyes, helpless. It wasn't Sengoku that held him back, it was justice. Never mind whether Akina dies at Garp's hands. Serious injuries are certain. Ace was silent for a while and said, talking won't get us anywhere. I will definitely escape today. My crew is still waiting for me. I will capture all of you one by one. White blow. Smoker's limbs instantly turned into smoke. He had eaten the smoke smoke fruit, which allowed him to turn his body into smoke to attack and track enemies. His fists and feet remained solid, but his arms and legs turned into smoke, accelerating his attacks and causing a lot of trouble for Ace. Rodney could only watch the fight between the two in embarrassment. While they had extraordinary abilities, he was not a devil fruit user, and he lacked hacky. He could only watch from the side, shivering and holding the melon in his hand. The flame flame fruit ability was particularly good at attacking. Ace had only recently obtained a devil fruit, and he wasn't yet proficient in using his powers. Otherwise, no one knows who would win in a fight against Smoker. Fire Fist Ace swung his fist suddenly, and his entire right arm turned into flames. The three-story high flame fist slammed toward Smoker. Boom! The buildings on the entire street were smashed, and the flames burned the broken walls. Smoker secretly thought that it was fortunate that Tashiji had evacuated the civilians. Otherwise, many people would have died. The determination in his heart to capture Ace became even stronger. Even if his grandfather was Garp, he must arrest him and bring him to justice. So what if your grandfather is a vice-admiral? He dares to fight against his boss and doesn't mind offending a marine hero. Rodney, who emerged from the ground, looked at the empty surroundings and said, Damn it! How many times do I have to say it? Don't use large-scale attacks like that. What if you hurt civilians? That's why I hate you, pirates. Looks and actual experience are two different things. His values cannot be indifferent. The world may be inherently twisted, but he is not. He can only take care of himself, but he will definitely help in any way he can. He can't understand Ace's behavior of disregarding the lives of others. Sorry. Fortunately, Ace acknowledged his mistake and apologized. At that moment, Smoker seized the opportunity and attempted to strike Ace. With his hands made of hacky infused smoke, he aimed for Ace's throat. If he landed a hit, it would be devastating for Ace. However, as Garp's grandson, Ace's quick reflexes and physical fitness, honed since childhood, allowed him to dodge the attack and counter with a powerful punch, hitting Smoker's chest with his flaming fist. Smoker continued to attack with his ten hands, forcing Ace back. Rodney approached, pulled out the short knife on his leg, and slashed at Ace. Ace helplessly remarked, You know, physical attacks don't do much damage to my body. Don't attack twice if it's embarrassing. Rodney shrugged and looked helplessly at Smoker. Captain Smoker, aren't you proficient in hacky? Can you lend me your weapon? I still need this for hacky, Smoker replied. He would have to practice later to fully master armament hacky, but for now, he was still learning. Chapter 8, Eat This Flying Sidekick Smoker's face darkened, and Rodney's words struck a nerve. He hadn't encountered any powerful pirates on the Grand Line, and now his body was also damaged, not as capable as before. I've been really slacking in training lately, he admitted. I'll exercise after I finish with this guy, he determined. Ace caught Rodney off guard and suddenly punched him, sending him flying into the air and rolling into the sea. Tisk, 
Smoker took a puff on his cigar and launched another attack. With a grim expression and a knife in his hand, Rodney emerged wet from the sea. He hadn't expected Ace, a guy with thick eyebrows and big eyes, to sneak up on him. It was beyond his expectations. Water release, water body, come forth, Rodney said. The water body ability could only be used when water was available. Initially, he didn't want to use it, but now he had no choice but to employ it. The sea water rose, and multiple Rodneys appeared beside him, swarming towards Ace. Why are there so many? Is he his brother? Ace wondered. Is he also a devil fruit user, he questioned. Ace realized the trouble he was in. This was Rodney's domain. Although each water body was not as powerful as the original, they still caused Ace some trouble due to their superior physical skills. After Ace smashed the first water body, the chakra-infused sea water slowed down his movements. Seizing the opportunity, Smoker unleashed ten hands on Ace, raining blows upon him. It was reminiscent of street gangsters bullying students. Ace got up and ran. His crew wasn't far, and they would arrive soon. Knowing that staying there for a long wasn't an option, he immediately fled. You think you can run after offending me? Rodney sneered, already devising a plan. Rodney infused Chakra into the sea water beneath his feet, creating multiple water bodies that charged toward Ace. As Ace ran, he looked up and saw a large amount of water descending upon him. Not good. Fire fist! Ace exclaimed. His flaming attack clashed with the water bodies, resulting in, steam. A significant amount of water mist adhered to Ace's skin under the high temperature, causing steam burns that made him cry out in pain. Hot, hot, hot. Ouch. Ace jumped and writhed in agony, desperately running forward. Even Rodney hadn't expected that water vapor could harm Ace. Was it because the water was seawater? It was something to consider. Come to me. Ace decided to rely on his fists rather than flames this time, as there were still a few water bodies remaining. He smashed one water body with a punch, but another one grabbed his arm. If he used his elemental ability at that moment, the previous situation would repeat itself. So, he swung his other fist, aiming to strike. Don't even think about it. Rodney warned. Another water body grabbed Ace's other fist. The remaining water bodies gathered together, transforming back into seawater and drenching Ace's body. A sudden sense of weakness overcame him. His devil fruit ability was suddenly nullified, leaving only his physical strength. He shifted from an elemental state to a purely physical one. Eat this. Flying sidekick. Rodney shouted. Justice descended from heaven as Rodney kicked Ace in the chest. Boom. Ace was sent flying, and Rodney flicked his hand, launching a steel wire that wrapped around Smoker's sea stone. Smoker didn't stop him, he allowed Rodney to use it. Rodney swiftly rushed towards Ace, and before Ace could recover, he placed his hands on Ace's throat, rendering him unable to resist. Damn it. You really got me this time, Ace yelled. I won't give up. Why don't I have any strength? This is sea stone, specially designed to restrain devil fruit users, Rodney explained. Then he turned around and asked, Captain Smoker, do you have any sea stone cuffs? Smoker replied loudly, the handcuffs are here. His subordinates immediately brought over the sea stone cuffs. There were only two pairs, specifically for restraining devil fruit users. After all, sea stone was a rare material produced only in Wayno country and its processing was extremely troublesome. Smoker had them at his disposal because he brought them from headquarters. Otherwise, how could they handle devil fruit individuals? Rodney said, I don't need the handcuffs, just hand him over to me. Smoker's face darkened, and he said, I don't care if he sees Garp or not. Right now, he must go to prison. Vice Admiral Garp can visit him later. Hey? I'm sorry, the old man wants to see his lovely grandson and I have to fulfill his wish, Rodney said solemnly. Smoker showed disdain and replied, Give me a break. You're nothing more than an opportunistic pirate hunter. You must have gained something from Vice Admiral Garp. Hand this guy over to me. As he spoke, smoke started rising from Smoker's body, indicating that he was ready to take action. If Rodney wouldn't hand Ace over willingly, Smoker would forcefully reclaim him. Smoker would never show mercy to pirates whose grandson Ace was didn't matter to him, even if he were Admiral Sengoku's grandson. Vice Admiral? Did Vice Admiral have special privileges? 
not even if they were marine heroes. I won't let you catch him. The Spade Pirates crew members, worried about their captain, rushed forward. They never expected that their once powerful captain would end up in such a situation. The crew quickly pulled the trigger and fired their guns. Smoker stood there, allowing the bullets to penetrate his body. Although he was considered the most useless Logia-type user, he was still a Logia-type user after all. Rodney's reaction speed was also exceptional. He dodged the bullets aimed at him with a few quick movements. Everyone, run away. You're no match for them. Ace, touched by his crew's attempt to save him, realized that facing these two individuals with strange abilities, his crew didn't stand a chance. They had to escape. Do you really think I'm invisible? White Snake. Smoker's arm transformed into smoke, snaking towards the pirates. The ship's doctor, Deus, threw a tube of green reagent to the ground, creating a cloud of green smoke. When the smoke cleared, they were all gone, leaving Smoker infuriated. You've got a clever crew, Rodney remarked. Mask Deuce understood the importance of running first and didn't have the foolishness to offer himself as bait for Smoker. Devil Fruit users were formidable opponents in the first half of the Grand Line and the Four Seas. Ace let out a sigh of relief and fell silent. He knew that today he would either go to jail or face the old man. But going to jail was much better than facing Garp. In prison, there was a chance of escape. If it were the old man. Although he could escape, he didn't want to. Before long, Tashiji returned with the sea stone cuffs and placed them on Ace. Rodney tossed the sea stone to Smoker and carried Ace on his shoulders. Hey, Rodney, what's your plan? Ace asked. Of course, I'm taking him to see Vice Admiral Garp, just as I said, Rodney replied. Smoker's face darkened, and he said, I don't care if he sees Garp or not. He needs to go to prison now. Rodney glanced back and cursed as he runs, damn it. The ship is here, his subordinates reported. They pushed an amphibious motorcycle toward him. Smoker infused the motorcycle with smoke, twisted the accelerator, and gave chase. Rodney took a quick look and exclaimed, Eight gates, activate. The mental constraints were lifted, allowing him to utilize 100% of his physical abilities. Rodney's speed surged, creating large waves as he raced across the sea, far surpassing Smoker and leaving only his back in Smoker's view. That bastard. I must capture him. Smoker shouted in frustration, determined not to let Rodney get away. Chapter 9, The Tradition of the Monkey Family Galloping across the sea, Rodney and Ace reached a rock where Logtown was no longer visible. Sitting down on the stone, Rodney was sweating profusely due to the heavy load. Opening the first gate was still a challenge, and it was only Garp's devil-style training that allowed him to endure for so long. Let go of me. My crew is still waiting for me. I won't see the old man. Ace protested. Sorry, that's none of my business. We're almost near Vice Admiral Garp, Rodney replied. He had brought Ace to hand him over to Garp, and he wouldn't stop until he completed his task. Even if Ace resisted, it wouldn't change his course of action. As long as he didn't stop, he could reach his destination. As long as he didn't stop, the path would continue. Cough, cough. Ace tried to struggle, but the power-restraining handcuffs prevented him from using his abilities, leaving him weak and unable to resist. Why did that old man want you to capture me? Ace questioned. Who knows? Maybe it was a whim. To be honest, even without eating the devil fruit, it would have been difficult for me to defeat you. But you made the mistake of underestimating the enemy by carelessly fighting someone with Logia-type devil fruit. And you don't know about Haki, Rodney explained. Rodney's successful capture of Ace was partly due to luck. He relied heavily on his elemental body, but Rodney had calculated his moves and, with the help of Smoker, managed to capture Ace. If I had faced Ace who knew how to use his devil fruit powers. I would have to run for my life. Rodney remarked. Meanwhile, Mask Deuce and the others managed to escape the Marines' pursuit. Deuce said, our captain has been arrested, and we need to find a way to rescue him. One of the crew members asked, but where can we find the captain? The man who captured the captain mentioned Vice Admiral Garp. Garp is a Marine hero from the Kingdom of Goa in the East Blue. Since our captain mentioned his hometown, Let's try our luck and head to the Goa Kingdom first, Diaz suggested. The other crew members nodded in agreement. Despite the captain's occasional odd behavior, his crew members couldn't leave him behind. He was their captain, and they were determined to rescue him. 
Spade Pirates. Captain Rescue Plan. Let's get started, they declared, filled with determination. Knowing that there were people who could walk on the sea, Ace asked, Hey! Aren't you afraid of being eaten by sea kings? Rodney replied, Oh, they are just right here. They can be used as mounts. The sea kings in the East Blue were not as massive as the ones in the New World, only tens of meters long. They were relatively easy to deal with, yet red-haired Shanks lost an arm to a sea king. TL slash N, man, this guy's been roasting Shanks. Danger. Ace suddenly noticed a magnified shadow beneath them and quickly moved away. Free labor has arrived. Rodney exclaimed as a sea king suddenly leaped out of the water, its lion head opening its mouth wide to bite them. Rodney spun around, chakra gathering in his legs. Leaf whirlwind. Bang. The Lion Sea King was knocked down with a powerful kick. Impressed, Ace said, that was amazing. Your physical strength is almost on par with mine before I ate the flame flame fruit. Rodney landed on the sea's surface, standing before the subdued Lion Sea King. He threatened, behave yourself, or I'll eat you later. The Lion Sea King displayed a fearful expression. In this world, animals could understand human words, but sometimes their intelligence was limited. The Lion Sea King had no choice but to accept its fate as Rodney held it by the mane, while Ace was left aside. Give me the direction to the nearest island, Rodney commanded. Although it was challenging to determine the direction to the Goa Kingdom at sea, he could use the Sea King to guide them to the nearest island, which would help them determine their location and make further plans. Ace remained silent as he couldn't use his powers and was unable to contribute much at the moment. After a while, he mentioned, I'm hungry. Let's eat. Rodney responded, taking out a ration pill from his pocket. Ace questioned, is this chocolate? And it's not enough to satisfy my hunger. Do you want to eat it? Rodney asked. Yes, I do, Ace replied. He preferred having something rather than nothing, so he opened his mouth wide, took the military rations pills, and bit it. Ace. It tastes awful, really awful. Ace couldn't tolerate the taste of the ration pill, which even he, who wasn't picky about food, found hard to stomach. It's all right. You had bad luck. The one I ate was honey-flavored. The taste of the military rations pills produced by the system was random, and most of them had an indescribable taste. Those who encountered the honey flavor were considered lucky. Military rations pills were not chocolate, and there was no guarantee about the taste of the next one. Is there anything else? Ace asked. Oh. One piece of this can keep a person full for a day and provide the necessary strength. Aren't you satisfied? Rodney explained. Of course not. How can something like that satisfy anyone's hunger? Ace couldn't believe that such a small and unappetizing pill could fill someone's stomach. Rodney pondered the situation. Ace's physical strength was different from that of ordinary people. He had been trained since childhood, and people in this world were known for having good appetites. It wasn't surprising that the military rations pills couldn't satisfy Ace's hunger. Rodney took out a handful of military rations pills. Seeing this, Ace protested, No. I won't eat those. Let me go. You, hoo hoo. A bubble of snot popped up, and Ace fell asleep suddenly. Rodney, is he really Garp's grandson? Dreaming anytime, anywhere. If Luffy can do it, so can Garp. The monkey family is terrifying. Setting Ace aside, as he couldn't escape anyway, Rodney's main concern was finding Garp. Are they left with no choice but to go to Windmill Village? The Sea King's speed was decent. Although this Sea King had tried to drown them in water when Rodney had caught it earlier, Rodney only needed to stay focused throughout the process. The Lion Sea King continued to swim with the three large bags on its head. There's a ship ahead. Take us to that ship, and your mission will be complete, Rodney instructed. It was only after the sun had set that they spotted a ship flying a skull flag a pirate ship. Upon hearing that the mission was about to end, the Lion Sea King's eyes lit up, and its speed increased. It jumped up, and Rodney held onto Ace as they landed steadily on the pirate ship. Rodney then declared, I'm sorry. I've confiscated your pirate ship. Who do you think you are, being so arrogant? Men, kill him. The captain of the pirate ship was a powerful man with a large axe, standing three or four meters tall, with a menacing appearance and a beard. The crew looked at Rodney and Ace with bewildered expressions, seemingly unsure about what to do. Tisk. 
Chakra surged through Rodney's legs as he jumped in front of the pirate captain. Leaf whirlwind. Death awaits you, the pirate captain growled. He swung his axe, but his movement slowed by a step, and Rodney kicked the axe's handle, bending it. With their combined force, it acted against the pirate captain, sending him flying and causing him to plunge into the sea. Hey, you'll be rewarded, big guy. The Lion Sea King seemed to sense something and jumped out, swallowing the pirate captain whole before sinking back into the sea. All right, who's next? Looking around, the pirates saw their captain defeated and began trembling, dropping their weapons. On a typical pirate ship, the captain was usually the strongest. Once the captain was defeated, the remaining pirates' will to fight would collapse, rendering them incapable of further resistance. Very well, I hereby declare that this ship is now mine. Turn it around and head to the kingdom of Goa. Prepare a lavish dinner, and take care of this guy. Don't mistreat him, or you'll end up like your captain. Kind-hearted people were rare in the pirate world, and although individuals like Luffy and Ace existed, they were in the minority. Rodney saw no need to be concerned about the experiences and thoughts of these pirates. Chapter 10, Rewards Goa Kingdom, Windmill Village Windmill Village was a small village, not much different from Syrup Village. It was quiet and peaceful, rarely invaded by pirates. It was also the hometown of the future pirate king. A warship docked at the port, which was a common occurrence for the villagers and a sign that the naval hero had returned to his native land. A pirate ship slowly docked, and the marine forces brought by Garp immediately cheered up, picking up their weapons and aiming their guns at the pirate ship. Garp's adjutant, Bogard, raised his hand and was about to order his men to fire when he saw Rodney standing at the bow of the ship. He immediately ordered them to wait. Adjutant Bogard, Rodney greeted Bogart. The pirate ship came to a stop, and the faces of the pirates on board turned pale. They had been under Rodney's control for more than half a month. They thought that getting rid of this plague god would allow them to regain their freedom, but now they were being handed over to the marines. Mr. Joestar, Bogard nodded in greeting. Rodney smiled and said, Adjutant Bogard, I will leave these guys to you. These pirates, none of them have clean hands. Understood. Thank you for your generosity, Bogard replied. He immediately ordered his men to arrest the pirates, who didn't resist because they knew that resistance was useless. They could only let the marines lock them up and wait until they are taken away and thrown into prison. Is this Vice Admiral Garp's grandson? You really caught him, Bogard said in surprise when he saw Ace, who was standing behind Rodney with a displeased expression. Ace had a much rougher, he didn't have good training along the way and was served as a special person. The food was delicious and spicy, but the little bit of meat he had would be gone after a training session. This guy eats as much as everyone on a ship. On the way here, I even hunted and killed two small sea kings to make up for his consumption, Rodney explained. Well, where is Vice Admiral Garp? I brought back his eldest grandson, Rodney asked. The Vice Admiral is at the only tavern in the village, Bogard responded. Okay, Ace, let's go. No, I don't want to see that stinky old man. Ace tried to resist Rodney, but it was futile with the sea stone cuffs on. He couldn't possibly match Rodney's strength. These are sea stone cuffs. Did Vice Admiral Garp's grandson also become a devil fruit user? Bogard asked, glancing at Rodney. Captain Smoker crossed paths with me. He put a bounty on me, three million bellies, so, Rodney looked at Bogart with embarrassment, implying the reason for Ace's capture. Bogart understood and smiled. No problem. It's simple to revoke a bounty under ten million bellies. I'll notify the authorities to lift your bounty. I didn't expect you to catch a devil fruit user. Having spent a few days together on the ship, they knew that Rodney wasn't a devil fruit user and would have a hard time dealing with people with devil fruit's abilities. But they were surprised that he managed to capture Ace despite that. Haha, <laughs> luck is luck. I'll be leaving now, and I'll leave him in your care, Rodney said, setting Ace down. No matter how much Ace struggled, it was useless. Ace? Isn't that Ace? Windmill Village wasn't that big, and the people at the port immediately recognized Ace, who had been away for a few months. They couldn't understand why he had suddenly returned and been captured. Excuse me, sir, could you tell me how to get to the tavern? Rodney stopped an old man wearing a yellow shirt with a heart symbol. The old man pointed in a direction and said, Go from there, turn right, and the third house on the right is the tavern. Why did you arrest him? Arrest him? 
his grandfather asked me to, Rodney replied without thinking. Ace, who was on Rodney's shoulder, exchanged a look with the old man, who smiled, making Ace feel uneasy. He had set off from Windmill Village with pride and ambition, but now he returned in embarrassment and humiliation. It was far from what he had imagined. He had envisioned returning after becoming the Pirate King, showing everyone in the village what he had accomplished. He wanted them to respect and admire him, as well as despise his father. Hey! Rodney, let me go. I don't want to come back here. Ace shouted, but no matter what he said, Rodney paid no attention. Every time Ace spoke up, Rodney would simply stuff his mouth with food. Snap! Garp's bubble of snot burst, and he woke up. No, I fell asleep, he muttered. Looking at the sleeping grandson in his hand, he punched him again. How long are you going to sleep, Luffy? Ouch! That hurts. Let me go. Luffy, who never gave up, weakly protested as he was being beaten by his grandfather, showing the deep psychological impact Garp had left on him since childhood. Smelly old man, let go of Luffy. Ace, weakened by the handcuffs, could only threaten Garp with his words. Sorry, Ace, I worked hard for my Rokushiki. We won't have any grudges afterward, Rodney reassured him. Bastard. You tied me up. How can there be no grudges? Once I break free from these lousy handcuffs, I'll beat you up. Ace shouted, feeling a mixture of shame and anger as he looked at the familiar surroundings and the villagers who had watched him grow up. This is it, right? Rodney and Ace arrived at the tavern. Before they entered, they heard Garp's roar from inside, Luffy, you brat. How many times have I told you to join the Marines and become a great Marine? Eat my iron fist of love. Ouch. It hurts so much. Grandpa. A boy's scream echoed from the tavern, accompanied by a gentlewoman's voice trying to calm Garp down. Vice Admiral Garp, stop hitting him. Luffy's face is all swollen. Upon hearing that Luffy's face was swollen, Ace shouted, Old man, stop hitting Luffy. Rodney, let me go. I want to protect Luffy. Rodney pushed the tavern door open, set Ace down, and said to the old man behind the bar, who was raising his fist and dozing off with a boy wearing a straw hat on his lap, Vice Admiral Garp, I've brought back the person you wanted. I'll take my leave now. Makina, the tavern's proprietor, saw Ace and exclaimed, Ace? Weren't you supposed to be out at sea? Ace. The other customers in the tavern also expressed surprise when they saw Ace. Garp and Luffy turned their attention to Ace at the same time. Garp was delighted, while Luffy was shocked. Ha ha ha. Well done, Rodney boy. You did a great job. Do you want to join the Marines and tag along with me? Garp laughed upon seeing Ace, who was still bound. He was very satisfied with Rodney's work. As Garp laughed, the system also notified Rodney that the task was completed. The 800 quest points Majestic Destroyer Flame, and Sharingan were credited to his account. A special chakra began to converge toward Rodney's eyes, causing him discomfort. He couldn't help but rub his eyes, and as he did, they turned red. Three black tomo swirled slowly around his pupils, giving his eyes a sinister and ominous appearance. Garp was taken aback and asked, Boy Rodney, what's wrong with your eyes? It's nothing. Occasionally, my eyes become like this, Rodney replied, concealing the fact that he now possessed Sharingan. Having acquired Sharingan, the world appeared different to him. Everyone's movements seemed extremely slow in his eyes. Even though he wasn't from the Uchiha clan, with the help of the system, he had seamlessly integrated with these eyes. However, it would take some time for him to get used to the slower world he perceived through his eyes. I have devil fruit too. Luffy, who had wriggled out of Garp's grasp, shouted as he saw Ace bound on the ground. His arm stretched out like a rubber pistol, striking Rodney at lightning speed. To Rodney, it appeared as if Luffy's attack was happening in slow motion. He swiftly dodged to the side, grabbed Luffy's arm, and threw him out of the tavern. All of this transpired in the blink of an eye, thanks to Rodney's enhanced vision. Chapter 11, Rodney vs Ace There was a lot of commotion outside, with Luffy yelling. Rodney immediately said in his mind, System, exchange for a leaf-style sword art, dance of the camellia, wind release, vacuum sphere, and water release, water colliding wave. 800 mission points were just received, 500 for leaf-style sword art, 50 for dance of the camellia, 
150 for wind release, vacuum sphere, and 150 for water release, water colliding wave. Rodney now had a total of 810 mission points. At that moment, Luffy rushed in again, ready to attack. Ace quickly stood in front of Rodney and stopped him, saying, Wait, Luffy, you're not his opponent. Luffy was determined to defeat Rodney, but even Garp knew that it would be difficult. Rodney had just beaten Ace effortlessly, and even Garp himself would have a hard time against him. Luffy couldn't just stand by and watch his brother being bullied. Get out of the way, Ace. I want to avenge you. Luffy said angrily. As brothers, they shared both blessings and difficulties. I understand, but you're not his opponent, Ace shook his head. He knew Rodney was still holding back in their previous battle, and Luffy would only be beaten if he fought now. But, Luffy wanted to say more, but Garp interrupted him and said, All right, Luffy. Although Rodney may not be as physically strong as you, his brain is sharper. It won't be easy for you to defeat him. Grandpa, he defeated Ace. Luffy was stubborn, just like his determination to become the Pirate King. It was in his blood as A.D. Since that's the case, I was originally planning to beat you up to teach you that recklessness leads to death. But now, I want to test out my new ability, Rodney said confidently. Luffy's unwavering beliefs made him immune to any beating from society. Perseverance was admirable, but persistent enemies could be quite annoying. Hey, Luffy, find a way to untie me quickly. You alone can't match him, Ace pleaded, seeing Rodney's sharing gone spinning. After a brief moment of distraction, he added, Find someone to untie me, ah. Rodney thought to himself, In order to adapt to this world, the system has made many changes, including cutting out illusions. In addition to enhanced vision and replication, Sharingan also had the ability to release and see through illusions. In this world, the release of illusions relied on disturbing the enemy's chakra, which would blind their senses. However, since there was no chakra in this world, Rodney wondered how he could use it. Therefore, the system changed it to spiritual energy. Illusions could only be released on enemies with weaker mental power. Those with comparable mental power would only experience a momentary trance, while those with stronger mental power would be unaffected. Acquiring the Sharingan greatly increased Rodney's chakra and mental power, raising it from 0.8 Kakashi to 1.4 Kakashi. Since Sharingan was compatible with him, Rodney could freely activate and deactivate it, greatly reducing the chakra consumption compared to Kakashi, who lacked Uchiha blood and suffered from long-term chakra depletion. Oh, I'll beat you up first, and then, Luffy's eyes met Rodney's, and he fell into a hallucination. Luffy, being only 14 years old, was no match for Rodney in terms of mental strength. He hadn't awakened the Haki yet, so he could only obediently enter the illusion and dream. Hey, Rodney boy, what did you do to my grandson? Garp was surprised by Luffy's sudden stupor and didn't notice the appearance of Haki. Rodney concealed his Sharingan, and his eyes returned to their usual black color. He casually replied, just a little trick to make him sleep. He'll be fine. Luffy collapsed on the ground, waking up from his slumber, and started exclaiming, Meat. So much meat. He he he. Bah ha ha, really? Garp laughed. All right, let's go. I'll take you somewhere else, and you, Ace, follow us. He led the way, carrying Luffy. Let's go, Rodney said, striding away, with Ace reluctantly following behind. Garp took them to Bogard and requested the key to unlock Ace's sea stone cuffs. Once Ace was freed, he felt his strength returning, and flames ignited on his body. The flame flame fruit is incredible, indeed. Vice Admiral Garp, your grandson is truly amazing, Bogard sincerely commented. Bwahaha, it's just a small thing, a small thing, Garp boasted proudly of his grandson's promising future. Rodney. As soon as Ace was free, he wanted to engage Rodney in battle again. Fire gun. Sparks shot out from Ace's fingertips, but Rodney easily dodged them and landed steadily on the open sea. Standing, on the water? How is that possible? Does he have a devil fruit? It's quite convenient for chasing pirates. Fire fist. Ace launched a blazing punch with scorching momentum. Rodney swiftly performed hand seals that he had been practicing for decades. Water release, wild water wave. A large amount of water gushed out of his mouth, resembling a river during the rainy season. The collision of fire and water created white water vapor. Rodney quickly formed another seal. Wind release, 
vacuum sphere. The wind technique tore through the water vapor, directly piercing Ace's body, leaving several holes and a mark on the ground behind him. Water release, water body. The sea water condensed into five water clones that ran staggeringly toward Ace. Each clone drew short knives from their legs, beseeching him. Having learned from his previous encounter, Ace didn't give the water clones a chance to plot against him. He destroyed four of them with long-range attacks but realized that none remained. Where did they go? Here. Suddenly, a figure leaped out from under Ace's feet. The dagger in their hand gleamed coldly in the sun, repeatedly stabbing at him. Dance of the Camellia. It was a technique from the Kagaya clan, known for its soft yet incredibly fast attacks. Underestimating the enemy meant certain death. Unfortunately, Ace's flame flame fruit gave him immunity to such attacks. Even if his body was pierced, it didn't affect him. A punch landed on Rodney's body, engulfed in flames, but Ace soon discovered that he hadn't hit the target. Rodney had turned into a puddle of liquid. Crash. His ankle was suddenly restrained as if something had grabbed his foot. He felt a momentary weakness in his body. Looking down, he saw that the sea stone cuffs, which had been taken from him moments ago, was now cuffed around his feet. Damn it. Ace knew he had lost again, this time in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He hadn't even used his full strength, which made him feel frustrated. Ha ha ha, Ace, having a devil fruit ability doesn't mean everything. Although Rodney may not be as physically strong as you, his techniques are far superior, Garp laughed and said, observing Rodney emerging from the ground. Rodney, you've done well. Would you like to join the Marines? Thank you, Vice Admiral Garp, for the compliment. Shall we proceed with our agreement? Rodney smiled, completely disregarding Garp's recruitment offer. No problem, what do you want to learn? Garp generously asked. I've already learned how to use Soru. So naturally, I want to learn the advanced version, Jeppo. Let's go with that. Rodney's request was straightforward. Vice Admiral Garp, is it appropriate to teach Mr. Rodney so many Rokushiki techniques? Bogard, as an adjutant, felt it necessary to remind Garp, a respected figure in the Marines. Rodney responded seriously, Adjutant Bogard, you're mistaken. The Rokushiki techniques aren't a secret in this world, are they? Many pirates in the New World have encountered Rokushiki users several times. Besides, I'm not a pirate, so there's no harm in learning them. Defected Marines within the Marines have also learned the Rokushiki techniques to some extent. It's a common occurrence, especially in the New World. Therefore, it could be considered an open secret. If they were to pay attention to every detail, they would have to be vigilant about many other things as well. Chapter 12, Commitment Relying on its excellent insight and the user's powerful learning ability, Sharingan can easily copy the opponent's ninjutsu, teijutsu, and even illusions. So, after Garp demonstrated the Jeppo, Rodney easily memorized the essence of the movements but still couldn't execute them. The main reason is that his body is not qualified enough. The Rokushiki has certain requirements for the practitioner's physical condition. Ninjas have high attack power but low endurance, and Rodney is no exception. Although his body is native to the world of pirates, he hasn't had much physical training. Therefore, he needs to exercise and also requires a shadow clone. But the shadow clone requires 1000 points to exchange, and he often forgets about it. He can only practice with all his strength for now, constantly strengthening his physical strength. He has learned to use shave, but he is still in the process of practicing the jeppo. Gomo Gomo no Gatling. Countless fists strike, but Rodney easily dodges them. Shave. He instantly appears next to Luffy, shadow of the dancing leaf. He kicks Luffy's chin, sending him flying, then jumps up, and in midair, he positions himself behind Luffy, parallel to him. He twists his body and kicks Luffy in the stomach. Leaf Whirlwind. Boom. Luffy is sent crashing into the ground. He gets up, brushes off the dust from his body, and says, that was close. You're really strong. With a serious expression, he straightens his straw hat. After being easily defeated by Rodney's Sharingan last time, Luffy, who is unwilling to admit defeat, challenges him again. Rodney initially refuses, but in the end, he is convinced by Luffy's persistence and has no choice but to agree. And now, here they are. Luffy's rubber fruit makes him immune to blunt attacks. Rodney's punches and kicks have no effect on Luffy, so he takes out Shurkens and Kunao, holding them between his fingers, 
and throws them toward Luffy. The shurikens collide in the air and change their trajectory. With Sharingan, Rodney has better control over the shuriken as he blocks Luffy's escape routes, leaving only a straight path toward him. Just as he anticipated, seeing that all his paths of retreat are blocked, Luffy charges forward, making hand seals, fire release. He jumps up, but Rodney seals his hands again, and within an instant, he spits out small fireballs. Fire release, Phoenix Sage Fire Technique. Oh no. Seeing that he can't dodge in midair, Luffy doesn't know what to do. He is only 14 years old, and his actual combat experience is not extensive, but he knows he can't rely solely on brute force. Can his rubber body withstand the high temperature flame formed by Chakra and hit it head on? The Phoenix Fire hits him, igniting his clothes, but miraculously, it does not affect the straw hat on his head. So, the straw hat is the real body, hey? Gomu Gomu no pistol. His arm stretches out and hits Rodney with force, but after a burst of white smoke, it turns out to be a log. Ha ha ha, Luffy, you're such an idiot. Rodney has already escaped. You're still too naive. Garp laughs from the side. His intuition had already sensed Rodney making a gesture in advance, and then he disappeared at a rapid speed, leaving behind a wooden stake disguised as himself for Luffy to hit. Where is he? Earth release, double suicide decapitation technique. Now, there is only a head on the ground. Let me go, set me free. Luffy yells, slapping the dust off his body, but Rodney ignores him. Using earth release is convenient, but it always leaves a lot of dust on his body, making taking a shower particularly troublesome. Ace, did you see that? Rodney enjoys fighting with his wits. You guys rely too much on your own abilities. This is where you fall short, Rodney boy, do you want to join the Marines? Your abilities are well suited for working in the marine. Garp, not giving up, extends an invitation to Rodney. However, Rodney instantly rejects it, and Ace on the side says, Old man, leave me alone. I want to venture out to sea. He still wears sea stone cuffs, but he can still move freely, but they also make his body weak and lacking strength, giving him an uncomfortable feeling of fatigue. Call me Grandpa. Garp punches him, leaving a smoking red mark on Ace's head. Old man. Damn it, you brat, why won't you call me grandpa? I want my grandson to love me too. Rodney boy, why don't you become my grandson? Garp's mind wanders a bit. He truly deserves to be Luffy's grandfather, not knowing how a dragon with an extremely high IQ could give birth to a Luffy with a rather simple mind. Could it be that Luffy inherited the mother's genes? The Garp family's genes have evolved in Luffy. Don't. Rodney takes a step back and looks towards the sea. It appears that a large ship is approaching. Sharingan activates in his eyes, greatly enhancing his vision. He can clearly see the flag on the ship and the people already on board, the spade pirates. Ace, your crew is here. What? Everyone, Ace is deeply moved. Suddenly remembering that Garp is still present, he becomes alarmed and says, No, they can't come here. Garp looks towards the seaside and laughs, Ha ha ha, Ace. It seems you've found a group of dependable crew members. The crew that will never abandon their captain at sea is a precious treasure for any leader. It seems he hasn't made a mistake in his judgment. Of course. Ace says proudly. Then he sees Garp heading towards the port wearing the cloak of justice and asks in shock, Wait. Old man, where are you going? Do I even need to say? A group of pirates has arrived, and I, as a marine, will naturally take action. Ace immediately rushes forward but is thrown back by Garp. Rodney helps him up, and Ace looks at him earnestly, saying, Rodney, let me go. I'm going to save everyone. He doesn't know how powerful Garp truly is, but he knows that Garp is stronger than him, stronger than his respected and resented father, and stronger than the crew of his ship. If Garp were to make a move, his crew, and his friends, would be helpless against him. Rodney looks at him. Of course, he can help Ace escape and remove his sea stone cuffs. He holds the key to the sea stone cuffs in his hand. However, if Ace escapes and enters the Grand Line, the chances of becoming Whitebeard's son are very high. Being loved by a father figure, it is easy for Ace to become his son after experiencing a father's love from Whitebeard. Afterward, Blackbeard, during the war Rodney simply looks at him and asks, Ace, do you have to become a pirate? That's only natural. Even if it means risking your life. I'm not afraid of death. 
even if it means dying in front of Vice Admiral Garp? Letting this old man who raised you watch you die without being able to do anything, and living with regret for decades. Isn't that painful for him, who is bound by justice, to witness his grandson's death at the hands of Akainu? Ace and Luffy are his grandsons. How can a grandfather not love his grandchildren? I, Ace hesitates this time. He holds a great deal of respect for Garp, even though he addresses him as stinky old man and old man. Garp is still his grandfather, even though he doesn't want to admit it. Rodney's question makes it difficult for Ace to make a choice. He is a pirate, and as a pirate, he will inevitably clash with the Marine. When he decided to become a pirate, he had already put life and death aside. But Rodney's question makes him suddenly feel a twinge of fear toward death. Allowing himself to die in front of the stinky old man, watching himself die while the old man can do nothing but feel guilt until he dies. How cruel is that? Even though Garp carries the title of a Marine hero, in front of his family, he is just an ordinary old man. Ace, what are you still pondering? They are your crew, your comrades. Shouldn't you be responsible for them? Luffy suddenly shouts, in his opinion, comrades are more important than anything else. Rodney's face darkens. Luffy's words solidify Ace's determination. He looks at Rodney and says firmly, I won't die in front of the stinky old man. Absolutely not. Rodney, I promise you here. Please help me. I am their captain, and I will take responsibility for them if I lead them out. Ah, uh, in this world, people always value loyalty above all else, which is admirable yet ridiculous at the same time. Chapter 13, Grandpa and Grandson Rodney gazed at Ace, a sigh escaping his lips as he realized that this man had made up his mind. Garp had dedicated his life to the Marines and fought to save the hard-working people living in dire conditions. Luffy had spent his whole life pursuing freedom and taking risks to become the Pirate King. And Ace, was he caught in Whitebeard's pit because he yearned for the fatherly love he had lacked? People are complicated, and the people in this world are even more so simple yet complex, easy to understand but difficult to comprehend. Ace loved his mother, a respectable and amazing woman. To bring him into this world, she had used a special method, forcing herself to endure a twenty-month pregnancy. After Garp appeared, she gave birth to Ace and died from exhaustion. He hated his father because his mother died because of him. Even though he was the Pirate King, the man who conquered the seas and embodied ultimate freedom, he couldn't protect his wife. If it wasn't for Garp, he might have perished as well. But he also respected Roger, the man who had conquered the seas and achieved the unprecedented feat of circumnavigating the world. Ace admired him for his ability to conquer the seas and become the freest person. While he respected him, he also yearned to become the Pirate King and prove himself. He wanted to demonstrate his strength and show that he was not inferior and hadn't let down his bloodline. There's no use dwelling on it further. Rodney simply said, I can help you, but you must agree to one condition. You must abide by it. This is a gentleman's agreement. Rodney spoke seriously, with his blood-red eyes locked onto Ace's. They stared at each other, and Ace said, Tell me the condition, and I will definitely abide by it. After you enter the Grand Line, if you encounter the Whitebeard Pirates, you must not join them. Can you agree to that? How could I join other pirates? I set sail to become the Pirate King. Then we will wait until you have survived Whitebeard's challenge. I will definitely become the Pirate King. Luffy shouted loudly, feeling uneasy. However, neither of them paid him any attention. Rodney nodded, took out the key to the sea stone cuffs, and freed Ace from his restraints. Ace felt the power surging through him, no longer suppressed. He nodded and said, although I don't like to admit it, Rodney, you are a man of principles. Yes, indeed. Especially when money is involved. Rodney pocketed the sea stone cuffs, watched Ace leave the area, and followed Garp. There was only so much he could do. Ace pursued freedom, and Garp pursued justice. It was undoubtedly torture for an old man to witness his grandson's death in front of him while being bound by the chains of justice. Rodney had a soft heart and couldn't bear to witness such a tragic drama. If Ace agreed to their agreement, Blackbeard would not catch him, let alone any other nonsense. If Ace didn't abide by the agreement, then he would have brought it upon himself. Rodney couldn't stop a man from pursuing freedom and affection. He did all this simply because he didn't want to see an old man suffer the pain of losing his grandson for the rest of his life. Garp was a good guy, and Rodney knew it. Whether from the anime or the time he had spent with him, Garp had shown his true nature. 
Hey, Rodney, let me out. Luffy shouted loudly. Rodney looked at the loose soil around him and said, You can figure it out on your own, soon. Swish. In an instant, Rodney disappeared with a burst of speed, and at the port, a fire had already ignited. Old man, I will never let you harm them. Ace's crew had arrived, standing on their ship, calling out their captain's name, wanting to take their captain away. Ha ha ha. Ace, do you think you can stop me, an old man? For your crew. Garp laughed heartily as he gazed at the wall of fire behind Ace. His eyes gleamed, and he asked with a wide smile, of course. Old man, I'm their captain. Ace had made up his mind to stand with his crew, no matter what. Because he was their captain. You are no match for this old man. Garp stepped forward, his aura as heavy as a mountain. The naval hero who had once stood alone against the legendary pirate rocks, even in his old age, retained his formidable presence. Ace took a step back, realizing that he couldn't defeat his grandfather, who was on PAR with his infamous father. Now, he stood no chance at all. However, he couldn't let the old man harm everyone. Flames enveloped his body as an invisible aura erupted from him, causing Garp to raise an eyebrow. The marines and ordinary villagers around them fell to the ground in the face of this overwhelming aura, with only a few managing to remain standing. Had Ace awakened his conqueror's hacky? Garp clenched his fists tightly, took a giant stride forward, and reached Ace with almost instantaneous speed. Ace didn't even have a chance to react before he was struck by Garp's iron fist of love. Boom. Ace was sent flying by Garp's punch, crashing through the wall of fire and landing directly on the spade's pirate's ship. His crew caught him holding him firmly. Captain Ace. Captain, are you okay? Captain. Dr. Deuce, please check if Captain Ace is all right. Ace was deeply moved as his crew surrounded him. Although Garp had hit him, he knew that the blow didn't carry much force. It felt more like an act of fulfillment than an actual punch. Enough talking. Deuce, turn the ship around. Let's go. Ace ordered. Yes, Captain. Deuce, the helmsman, responded eagerly, turning the ship's bow upon receiving the order. The ship accelerated, swiftly leaving the port. Tisk tisk, Rodney boy, look at those cannonballs. Cannonballs. At some point, Garp had already arrived on a warship, and Rodney quickly joined him. Rodney appeared helpless as he handed a lead cannonball, the size of an ostrich egg, to Garp. The warship and the pirate ship were only a few hundred meters apart. With Garp's strength and accuracy, there was no way he would miss. But Rodney didn't expose Garp, instead, he watched silently as Garp sent his grandson off into the sea in his own way. He was only annoyed that Ace had slipped away without a word, setting sail without saying goodbye to him. It had been a prank on Rodney, but he didn't expect Ace to genuinely escape. It was all right, though. This way, Garp's grandson could pursue his own path. Fist meteorite. The cannonball struck the side of the pirate ship precisely, fired with such speed that it seemed to materialize through the barrel. The impact fueled the pirates' retreat, urging them to leave the area swiftly. You stubborn boy, don't let that old man catch you. Watching the pirate ship sail away, Garp laughed. Grandpa. Thank you for taking care of me all this time. Ace knelt on the ship, slamming his head in Garp's direction. Hearing Ace finally call out Grandpa, Garp's sturdy body trembled slightly, and he chuckled, this brat is just too stubborn. This old man wants him to become a marine, he insisted on becoming a pirate king. I really don't understand what's so great about that. Rodney boy, don't become a pirate either. I probably won't, as long as no one forces me. I think being a pirate hunter is pretty good. Rodney shrugged, choosing not to question the old man's words. Instead, he asked, Vice Admiral Garp, do you truly have no regrets? Regret? I never regret anything I do. If he doesn't want to, the old man can't tie him down and prevent him from pursuing his own freedom for the rest of his life, can he? That's beyond this old man's capabilities. Is that so? Rodney understood that Garp couldn't do anything to Ace. It was evident from the original story that if he wanted to, he could have captured Ace during the first half of his notorious journey. Yet, he chose not to and silently watched his grandson sail the seas, following his own path. Buh ha ha let's not talk about that. These recruits were easily knocked down, I'll have to train them well. As marines, they can't be so weak. Garp said, 
offering silent prayers for this group of marines. At that moment, Luffy rushed over, standing on the warship and shouting loudly, Ace! Wait for me! I'll never give up on finding One Piece! Garp's face darkened. Luffy! Bang! Garp landed a powerful blow on Luffy's head with an iron fist, grabbing him by one hand and pulling him off the warship, saying, Looks like I'll have to train you properly. Ah! Grandpa, let me go! Grandpa! Chapter 14, Ace's Wanted Poster Garp would always return to Windmill Village to visit his grandson during his vacations. As his vacation neared its end, he left feeling satisfied but equally exhausted, just like Luffy and Rodney, who he had trained relentlessly. Garp had mentioned that Roni's body was weak and lacked vitality, making him susceptible to danger on the battlefield. This statement marked the beginning of Rodney's rigorous training once again. Day in and day out, Rodney would train during the day and condense chakra at night, following a repetitive cycle until the end of Garp's vacation. His grueling training routine was finally coming to an end. With each passing day, Rodney consumed military rations pills, a food rich in energy, to nourish his body. He spent his days exposed to the elements, embracing the sun and wind, causing his skin to take on the same color as the villagers of Windmill Village. If this continued, he might even resemble the wreckage. No, I must master all Rokushiki as soon as possible and learn how to control my life force, one. Otherwise, I might truly become a resident of Windmill Village, Rodney thought to himself. Luckily, Rodney had the Sharingan, which allowed him to record Garp's movements when he utilized Rokushiki. He only needed to learn them and find a way to integrate them. Mastering the control of the life force would become a real possibility. However, before that, he had to focus on learning Rokushiki. Why didn't I choose the Shadow Clone technique directly? Rodney pondered. Then he remembered the prohibitive cost of using the Shadow Clone technique, realizing that he couldn't afford it. Damn it, I have a mission to complete. Rodney exclaimed. Ding! Mission released. A notification sounded. Is it really that easy? Rodney questioned. The mission read, Assassinate the Pirate Clive Gaza. Mission level, D+. Reward, 100 mission points. TL slash N, previously named Clive Zaizuo meaning lower seat in Chinese but changed it to Gaza for better immersion. Clive Gaza? Who's that? Rodney wondered aloud. On the warship, as they departed, Rodney asked Adjutant Bogard about this individual. Before joining Garp, Adjutant Bogard had been a member of CP3, specializing in intelligence. After a moment of contemplation, he replied, Clive Gaza is the captain of the artillery pirates. He has a bounty of 11 million bellies and commands a crew of 1,000 pirates. The artillery pirates are known for having the most powerful artillery in East Blue. They were last spotted in Guerrero Village two months ago, where Captain Smoker tried to capture them but failed. Escape from Smoker? That's quite impressive, Rodney commented. Smoker's strength was renowned in East Blue. With his Logia-type Devil Fruit ability and mastery of Rokushiki, he was a formidable opponent. For Clive Gaza and his crew to have evaded Smoker's pursuit indicated their own level of skill. What? Are you planning to confront him? Adjutant Bogard inquired. Rodney smiled confidently and replied, Of course I am. The location map of the target appeared on the screen in front of him. Given the vastness of the sea, it would be nearly impossible to find someone without assistance, hence the need for the map. For now, let's head to the nearby marine branch to gather more information. Thank you for your help during these days, Rodney said as he jumped off the ship, effortlessly walking on water. Has Rodney left? Garp asked, wearing his dog hat and munching on a donut. Yes, do you think he should have joined the marines? Bogard asked. Rodney possessed the right qualities, mindset, and sense of justice to become a valuable asset to the Marines. Garp had extended numerous invitations to him, but Rodney always declined, stating that he didn't want to be constrained by orders. Instead, he chose to continue his career as a pirate hunter. Recruiting him would be futile. Besides, isn't being a pirate hunter quite profitable? Garp responded. Indeed. Pirate hunters can exchange captured pirates for bounties. Exchanging a 10 million bellies pirate for a bounty would take an ordinary family a considerable amount of time to accumulate, Bogart explained. I see. Then let's become pirate hunters, Garp chuckled, causing Bogart to worry. Garp's daily distractions from his duties were giving Bogart a headache. Vice Admiral Garp, 
the Marines don't offer bounties for killing pirates, he reminded him. It was the Marines' responsibility to apprehend and eliminate pirates, and if successful, they would receive a substantial bonus. However, they were not entitled to the exorbitant bounties offered for capturing notorious pirates. Ha ha ha, I completely forgot about that. Garp laughed. He glanced at Rodney, who was teaching a sea king creature in the distance, and remarked, This kid, as long as he doesn't stray from the right path, he could become a true ally of justice. Garp understood that Rodney possessed kindness in his heart. As long as the corrupting influences of the pirate-infested sea didn't taint that kindness, Rodney would undoubtedly shine as he was meant to. Rodney knew the difference between good and evil. He would become furious when pirates harmed others, and he would be equally furious when he witnessed acts of heroism. He would remain indifferent to things he couldn't see or touch, but if someone dared to disregard his words in front of him, he would make sure they paid the price. Violence was not his preferred method to combat violence, but in this world, it was the prevailing norm. Even the Marines, an institution responsible for upholding justice, ultimately relied on violence. Rodney could only take care of what was within his reach, focusing on the tangible. As for matters beyond his immediate sphere, he struggled to address them. He was still in the early stages of his journey, alone and vulnerable. Sitting atop the Sea King, with his eyes bearing the Sharingan, Rodney flawlessly controlled its movements with his mental power, employing it as his means of transportation. The Sharingan was proving to be incredibly useful. The Sea King swiftly traversed the ocean while a seagull glided overhead, carrying a hat-wearing, slightly tattered leather bag. Rodney patted the Sea Kins, signaling it to halt, and waved at the seagull in the sky, exclaiming, Over here, over here, deliver the newspaper. The newsbird, responsible for newspaper deliveries, descended from the sky and perched on the Sea King's edges. In a remarkable display, it extracted a newspaper from its wings. Rodney retrieved a hundred bellies and deposited them into the bird's leather bag as a token of appreciation. To think, a hundred bellies could buy two choppers. Chopper, valiantly fighting alongside millions of bellies' bounties with just a few bellies, stirred a sense of pity within Rodney. With the news bird flying away, Rodney resumed his journey on the Sea King, turning his attention to the newspaper in his hands. The World Economy newspaper was known for unearthing numerous stories from around the world. Morgan's the organization's leader, was often dubbed the number one paparazzi in the world, always chasing after big news. The newspaper contained stories from the New World, describing various events that occurred during the first half of the Grand Line. Notably, it emphasized the pirate graveyard, a focal point for the Marines, and the seven warlords of the sea. The words are exquisite and the rhetoric is gorgeous, and really deserves to be the person who eats this bowl of rice, too. Hey? A wanted warrant? This guy is. Ace. There was a wanted warrant in the newspaper, with Ace's smiling face on it. Poor gas D Ace. Fifty million bellies. Dead or alive. Has this guy spent two months on the Great Line and already made a name for himself? It's really fast. Shaking his head, he hoped that he would abide by the agreement with him. The arrest warrant flew away with the wind, while Rodney continued to pay attention to the news in the newspaper. Only a handful of pirates managed to survive encounters with them and make their way to Sabaody Archipelago. Among them were those who passed through Fishman Island, but few pirates dared venture into the treacherous New World. Those who did were confronted by the formidable subordinates of the Four Emperors. In the New World, the Four Emperors held absolute authority. New pirates had two choices, either submit and serve under one of the Four Emperors or challenge them. Submission ensured survival, while challenging them meant certain death. The newspaper recounted a tale of a pirate with a 530 million bellies bounty who foolishly dared to challenge Big Mom. However, he met his demise when Big Mom's first mate, wielding a pair of sticks, pummeled him into submission. The unfortunate pirate had accidentally consumed a cake belonging to Big Mom, sealing his fate. Of course, there were exceptions. If a pirate managed to impress one of the four emperors, they might be spared. Whitebeard would take you in as his son if he deemed you worthy. Big Mom would accept you as her son-in-law if she favored you. If you possessed unique and potent blood, she might even accept you as a husband. Kaido would consider you a younger brother if he took a liking to you. Otherwise, he would send thunder and lightning your way, sentencing you to a lifetime of mining. Shanks would invite you to share a drink if he found you agreeable. Having finished reading the newspaper, Rodney found himself somewhat bored. He still had a long way to go before reaching his goal, and the days ahead promised to be monotonous. 
I must buy some books next time I come across a town. I wonder what kind of novels this world has to offer. Hopefully, they'll be more interesting, Rodney mused. Chapter 15, Mission Hall East Blue, Sherlock Village, is surrounded by a group of pirates. On the sea, pirates are synonymous with freedom. But where does their wealth come from? Naturally, it is taken from ordinary people. There are only a few who search for treasures, and the world doesn't have an endless supply of treasures for them to find. So, instead of squandering their wealth, pirates choose a more convenient and beneficial method grabbing it. The so-called freedom and dreams of pirates are just a facade. They leave their homes and come to the vast sea, relying on plundered wealth to indulge in excesses, squandering money, overeating, and engaging in brutality. This is the harsh reality for most pirates. Come, come, support our artillery pirates. Once our captain becomes the king of the pirates, we will reward your village greatly, a thin and tall man resembling a bamboo pole laughed, his eyes scanning the terrified villagers without remorse. The surrounding pirates, with their vicious looks and unscrupulous eyes, checked the crowd to see if there were any women they fancied, seeking solace from their loneliness at sea. The young girls cowered in fear, hoping not to draw any unwanted attention. The village chief of Sherlock Village, an old man trembling in fear, spoke up, My lord, our village, is truly out of money. Please show mercy. Sherlock Village is not a wealthy village. If it weren't for its remote location, it would have ceased to exist long ago. Occasionally, pirates would raid the village, leaving the residents to scrape together what little money they could. They lived frugally, but recently, one pirate group took away most of the village's money, only for another group to arrive shortly after. How can they survive in such times? What? No money. Old man, you must be asking for death. One of the bear-like men exclaimed, grabbing the village chief with a grip. It seemed like he would crush the old man at any moment. The sharp glimmer of a knife illuminated the village chief's face, and the adults in the village were filled with trepidation. It wasn't that they didn't want to resist, but they were powerless against the pirates who terrorized ordinary people during the Age of Great Voyages. Who is Clive Gaza? A sudden voice echoed from behind, causing all the pirates to turn their heads. It was Rodney, dragging two large men with him as he approached slowly. The pirates recognized the men Rodney was dragging, they were the ones who stayed aboard their ship. Boy, who are you? The bear-like man threw the village chief aside and advanced towards Rodney, attempting to grab him with his massive hand. Observing the towering man, Rodney shook his head helplessly. The people in the pirate world were well-fed and incredibly strong. With a single strike, the bear-like man was sent flying, crashing into a large tree and losing consciousness. The pirates present were stunned. They were among the top ten fighters in their group, yet this person easily overpowered them. Why are you still standing there? Attack. There's only one of him and so many of us. Stand together, urged the man with the bamboo pole, seemingly of higher rank among the pirates. Incited by his words, the group charged at Rodney. Shadow of the Dancing Leaf Leaf Whirlwind Leaf Great Whirlwind Fire Release, Phoenix Sage Fire Technique Fireballs exploded one after another amidst the pirate crowd, scattering them in all directions. As Rodney advanced with his knife, his movements were swift, surpassing that of the miscellaneous pirates. However, he was not as astonishing as Karu. Drawing a short chakra blade from his leg, Rodney effortlessly sliced through the bamboo pole man's skin, muscles, and trachea. The man with the bamboo pole gasped for breath, his mouth wheezing like broken bellows as blood filled his windpipe, his life rapidly fading before his eyes. Boom! A cannon roared, blowing up the spot where Rodney had stood moments ago and affecting the bamboo pole man as well. The force from the cannon blast sent him flying, and he vanished from sight. The one who fired the cannon was a 2.5 meter tall man smoking a cigar holding a rather thick cannon in his hand. Throwing the cannon to one of his crewmates and taking another from the crewmate's hand, the man, known as Artillery Clive Gaza, a pirate with a bounty of 11 million bellies, exuded arrogance. He was preparing to set sail on the Grand Line. Ha ha ha, you're done for, little one. How dare you cause trouble? Ha ha ha, that idiot Charles was knocked by someone like you. Clive laughed disdainfully, smoke enveloping him, accentuating his wickedness. A chill ran down his spine as he thought he heard the sound of flesh and blood being torn apart. Ninjas are capable of teleportation, Mr. Clive, Rodney appeared behind him with a smile. The white light chakra saber had already pierced Clive's back, 
burying the 40 cm long blade within his body, leaving no chance for treatment. How, how did this happen? You can still talk? Oh, I forgot to draw the saber. With a smile, Rodney pulled out the saber, causing blood to gush out like a fountain. It was red, just red, devoid of any strange colors. Captain. Captain. How can this be? Captain, what are you doing, Captain? The pirates stared in disbelief at their captain who had been attacked. This big pirate with a bounty of 11 million bellies had been brought down by an unknown pawn. Impossible. This was absolutely impossible. Are you still dreaming? You all are next. Rodney kicked the dying Clive and then charged toward the pirates. Anyone who resisted was killed, while those who tried to escape were knocked down. Rodney demanded they hand over all the money remaining on the ship as compensation for the mental anguish inflicted upon the village's residents. The grateful villagers of Sherlock Village thanked Rodney wholeheartedly for his intervention. Although they wanted Rodney to stay for a meal, he declined. Before departing, he took a few pieces of dried meat as snacks for the journey. He instructed the remaining pirates to bury the bodies of their fallen comrades. Among them, only Clive Giza and the Bamboo Pole Man had bounties. As the deputy captain, the Bamboo Pole Man had a bounty of three million bellies. Rodney severed his head and took both of them along. The pirate ship sailed off with the remaining crew, including Rodney, who would be taken by them to the nearest naval branch and imprisoned. Don't even think about running away. If you try to escape, be prepared to be fed to the Sea Kings, Rodney smiled devilishly. Now that the ship was floating on the sea, it was too late for any escape attempts. Desperate expressions appeared on the pirates' faces, resigned to being taken into custody. Jumping off the ship to be devoured by Sea Kings was not a favorable alternative. Being apprehended offered a chance at survival. Rodney snorted, if any of you had bounties, I would have dealt with all of you to prevent future trouble. You will always have to pay the piper when you venture out. This group of people was too weak, and he had no intention of killing them. Having completed his mission, Rodney realized that the mission hall was now accessible. Ding! The host has completed 20 missions, and it is time to open the mission hall. The mission hall? He opened the so-called mission hall and discovered that it was a place to pick up missions. Instead of receiving them one after another, he could now choose missions. Not all were assassination missions. There were escort missions, where he had to protect a certain merchant ship, spy missions, where he had to gather intelligence on the private life of a king from a certain kingdom, and missions to help a certain tavern sell alcohol. However, these were all D-level tasks, ranging from 10 to 100 points, and offered no special rewards. The C-level missions had yet to appear. The system explained, from now on, the host can freely accept tasks. However, the tasks selected by the system cannot be evaded. In other words, the tasks assigned by the system had to be accepted and could not be avoided. This increased the level of freedom and task selectivity. Chapter 16, Rodney at 153rd Branch 153rd Marine Branch Rodney arrived at the THE-153RD Marine Branch and handed over a group of artillery pirates to the Marines. In exchange, he received the bounties for Clive Giza and the Bamboo Pole Man. After collecting the bounty, Rodney decided to find a restaurant to have a meal. He was tired of eating the mediocre food made by pirates. Their meals were barely edible, and he didn't expect much in terms of taste. Guest, please enjoy your meal, the waiter said as he brought a large plate of meat that smelled delicious. Just as Rodney was about to dig in with his fork, a loud dog barking could be heard from outside. Moments later, a large wolf burst into the restaurant, heading straight towards Rodney. But Rodney wasn't about to let the wolf succeed. He swiftly kicked the wolf away, causing the whole restaurant to fall silent. The wolf, having bumped into the wall, got up and barked at Rodney twice before looking at him with fear. The owner of the restaurant immediately warned him, Brother, you should run. This wolf belongs to Captain Morgan's son. If you beat his wolf, he won't let you go. Rodney seemed to remember the name, Captain Morgan. He was the marine captain who had caught Koru and was promoted to the rank of captain. After being hypnotized, Morgan's temperament changed drastically, turning him into a proud and cruel individual ruling over Shell's town and the 153rd branch of the marine. Just as the restaurant owner finished speaking, a yellow-haired kid with a double chin and slicked middle part hair entered, followed by two marines with unpleasant expressions on their faces. If they could, they would have loved to beat up the kid, but they knew better than to do so considering the kid's connection to Captain Morgan. 
Rodney glanced at the boy, who was dressed in colorful clothes, and instantly knew he was trouble. He heard him sobbing and saying, Who? Who is it? How dare you beat my pet wolf? The wolf Rodney had kicked merely barked at its owner, a guy named Helmeppo. Helmeppo immediately scolded him angrily, accusing Rodney of being a pirate and ordering his men to capture him. The two marines approached Rodney reluctantly, their faces filled with bitterness. They whispered, sorry, before Rodney swiftly knocked them unconscious. Smiling, he grabbed a piece of meat from the plate, ate it with his hands, and walked over to Helmeppo. You want to catch me, kid? Rodney taunted. Helmeppo was terrified and backed away, eventually falling to the ground. He desperately mentioned his father, my father is Captain Morgan, the strongest man here. How dare you try to harm me? Rodney, still chewing on his meat, mockingly replied, Oh, I'm so scared. He then slapped Helmeppo, causing half of his face to swell up. The boy covered his face and ran away, crying bitterly. The restaurant owner, witnessing the scene, urged Rodney to run away. He warned him that Captain Morgan would not be easy to deal with and that beating his son would surely bring trouble. Rodney appeared small and weak, and facing the burly Morgan, it was clear he wasn't an opponent. However, Rodney reassured the owner and sat back down to continue his meal. The taste was passable, and after the recent slap, it felt even more satisfying. The restaurant owner grew anxious, worried that a fight would break out and damage his establishment. He didn't want to suffer the consequences and losses. In martial arts novels, conflicts often erupted in inns, and it was the inn owners who suffered the most. The owner contemplated running away to avoid the mess, as his small business couldn't afford the aftermath. Meanwhile, footsteps could be heard approaching. Helmeppo had brought his father not long after. It was indeed Captain Morgan, who had just returned from the Marine. Upon entering the town, he encountered his beaten son, fueling his anger and prompting him to bring reinforcements. Due to his jaw being crushed by Koru, Captain Morgan now had an iron jaw with the Marine logo and carried a sharp axe in his right hand. He was tall, towering over others, and exuded a sense of contempt. As expected of Axe Hand Morgan, he had single-handedly defeated the Black Cat Pirates, overthrowing even the renowned Kuro of a hundred plans, with one swing of his axe. Rodney finished his plate of meat, picked his teeth with a toothpick, and casually asked, Are you his father? Rodney's nonchalant demeanor angered Morgan, who raised his axe, ready to strike. But then his body froze. Your, your eyes, Morgan's body trembled uncontrollably as he felt like he had forgotten something. But he couldn't remember what it was. In Rodney's crimson pupils, three black tomo slowly rotated, shattering false memories and replacing them with the vivid recollection of that bloody night. Morgan's tall figure swayed and fell to the ground. Boss, here's the payment for the meal. Rodney threw a belly onto the table, chewed on his toothpick, and left. None of the marine personnel who tried to block him dared to interfere. Rodney had used his Sharingan to break the hypnosis that had been cast on Morgan by the hypnotist Django. Now, it was up to Morgan to decide how much he could change. At the very least, he would no longer be as arrogant and cruel as before. The restaurant fell silent, and all the guests held their breath, fearing that something might happen to Morgan. Helmeppo cried out, Dad, Dad, wake up. Don't scare me. The marine officer checked and found that Morgan was breathing normally and had no visible injuries. He reassured Helmeppo, Master Helmeppo, don't worry. Captain Morgan just fainted. It's nothing serious. You don't need to be overly concerned. Then why are you still standing there? Take my dad back. Belumbo exclaimed. Yes, sir. The marine officer cursed silently, annoyed at the situation. With the help of a few others, they reluctantly carried Morgan away. Mission, escort the merchant ship to Kokoyasi village. Mission Level, D. Mission Reward, 20 Mission Points. The mission proceeded smoothly and in an orderly manner. The escort mission was not particularly challenging, in fact, it could even be described as leisurely. Rodney used this time to continue exercising and improve his physical strength. In the pirate world, reaching the pinnacle merely required honing the body. For instance, when Garp was young, he and Roger's crew faced the formidable Rocks Pirates. None of the members of Roger's crew had consumed devil fruits, and Garp didn't need such abilities either. It demonstrated that strengthening the body alone could make one among the strongest in the world. The eight gates must be learned as soon as possible, and the physical body must be raised to a high level so that he can open the seventh gate, 
this is the apex. He will only open the eighth gate when he is ready to die with the other party, otherwise, he's either stupid or just crazy. Ah, but he felt that he would never have this chance in his life, because he didn't want to die yet. Rodney had already memorized Garp's techniques, and now he needed to focus on improving his weak constitution. This was his weakness, shared by most ninjas high attack but low endurance. Not everyone could be as formidable as Hashirama Senju, Madara, Guy, or Rakage, who had mastered the lightning release armor. Therefore, Rodney continued his physical training, ensuring he had enough nutrition to support his growth. It was a process that required time and dedication. He combined his tasks with his exercise regimen, effectively managing both aspects. This was his current routine. Chapter 17, Krieg Pirates Task, Kill Krieg Mission Level, C Reward, 500, Mission Points Permanent Chakra Fruit, Shadow Clone Jutsu, Leaf Dragon God This mission was not available in the mission hall but was a special mission issued by the system itself. The rewards were comparable to the mission to capture Ace, indicating its significance. Krieg Pirates? Weren't they the pirate group that was chased back to East Blue by Dracul Myhawk just a week after entering the Grand Line? It seemed that this pirate group, which claimed to be the largest in East Blue, was directly cut down by Myhawk alone, along with their 5,000 members. Thinking about it, it made sense. A weak group led by a powerless leader with 5,000 cannon fodders would obviously be no match for the strongest swordsman in the world. But how did my hawk manage to cross the comm belt alone in a small boat? Did he really row with his arms and use his supreme sword, Yoru, as an oar? It seemed the source of his motivation couldn't be easily explained. Witnessing my hawk rowing a boat in the comm belt shattered the aloof image of Krieg, the leader of the pirates. It made Rodney wonder what Krieg had seen that made him run. Things were definitely not as simple as they seemed. So, what did Krieg, the unlucky ghost, one, see? Meanwhile, Rodney was on an escort mission, following the merchant ship. At this point, Krieg was not as powerful as he would become later, and Rodney was uncertain about the size of the pirate group. He needed to formulate a plan while en route. Should we go to Logue Town and inform the smoker first? Rodney contemplated, touching his chin. He thought it would be a good idea. Although Smoker was a hard worker, he was barely a 50 to 50 match. However, he resembled Kakashi to some extent. Rat's note, despite Smoker's strong work ethic, he could only hold his own at a mediocre level, making him an average match at best. Nevertheless, he shared certain similarities with Kakashi, indicating some resemblance between the two. It had been two or three days since Rodney left Branch 153, and he still had a long way to go before reaching Logue Town. Using his positioning ability, he discovered that the Krieg pirates were not far away from him. So, should he launch a frontal attack or attempt a sneak attack? Rodney decided to start with a direct confrontation and then transition into an assassination, acting as an ineffective assassin. Alas, not everyone could be a crown assassin, too, wielding a big sword and wearing a heavy helmet, able to decapitate anyone who opposed them and even devour them when hungry. A battle between a real assassin and a false assassin would ensue. But for now, Rodney put those thoughts aside and focused on his training, as it brought him happiness. Three days later, on a sunny day, Rodney was ready to take action. He gathered various tools such as ninja footwear, shuriken, kunao, and explosive tags. He noticed that the Krieg pirates were approaching the merchant ship, so he used his chakra to walk on water and reach the observation deck. Activating his sharingan, he gained a distant line of sight. On the far horizon, a fleet was slowly approaching. Each ship in the fleet bore the same pirate logo, a skull with an hourglass on each side. The lead ship, a massive sailing vessel, featured a bow ornament resembling a fierce and aggressive Black Panther. Krieg Pirates Rodney smiled, but his first task was to inform the merchant ship's boss to retreat swiftly. What? Pirates? The boss, a fat-headed man, showed no fear upon hearing the news. In fact, he responded, it's because of the pirates that I hired you. Otherwise, what would I need your guards for? These guys are your responsibility. Rodney retorted, I can't protect so many people. The boss shrugged and said, then I don't care. You have to figure it out. You're the pirate hunter Joestar J. Rodney, and this is your problem, not mine. I hired you, so find a solution. Feeling the urge to throw his slipper at the boss's face, Rodney glared at him 
using his Sharingan's illusion to make the boss issue the order to halt the fleet. After shaking his head, Rodney left the room. Following the fat boss's orders, the fleet came to a stop. There wasn't just one merchant ship, there was another one behind it. Every day, these ships transported goods, including local products, tobacco, alcohol, and other legal items. The boss was quite conscientious and didn't involve himself in illegal activities. The ships carried guards, but based on Rodney's visual assessment, they didn't seem capable of matching his strength. This indicated that these guards were here for a livelihood rather than combat. Merchant ships weren't like passenger ships, they weren't filled with people. Besides the main staff members who served as guards, there were only around a hundred people on board. In a real fight, Rodney might not be able to protect them all. With a nod, Rodney leaped off the ship and landed on the rough sea. His body rose and fell with the waves as he walked atop the water. This time, there were no sea kings to attack him along the way, which left him somewhat disappointed. He had hoped to catch a sea king and use it as free labor, but it seemed he would be disappointed. Nonetheless, he was prepared. With such a long distance to cover, he could carry out numerous operations. Water release, water body. Three clones made of seawater emerged, and Rodney handed each of them an explosive tag. The clones charged toward the approaching fleet. He kept his Sharingan hidden to conserve Chakra. Although the Sharingan perfectly complemented his abilities, saving Chakra was crucial for an imminent large-scale battle. Dreadnought Saber This was the galleon sailed by the self-proclaimed pirate Don Krieg, and it housed most of his elite soldiers. Krieg wore thick gold armor, had light purple hair, and wore a turban on his head. He looked average, as the people in the pirate world ranged from extremely beautiful to hideously ugly, with few in between. Maybe it was better to be ugly, it gave them personality. But such thoughts were subjective. Little ones, aren't you bored? Krieg asked, bored himself, resting his head on his hand. Sailing was a tedious task, and the boredom often outweighed any excitement. Chief Krieg, there's a caravan stopped in the distance, the lookout on the observation deck called out, using a telescope. Oh? A caravan. Krieg perked up, amused by the prospect. Little ones, get ready and inform the crews on the other ships. Today, we're going to have a big fight, he declared, laughing heartily. The pirates on the ship raised their weapons and joined in the cheerful shouting. Idiamon, the staff officer of the Krieg pirates, asked, Chief Krieg, should we use our usual strategy? No, let's approach directly this time. I'm tired of employing the same tactics repeatedly. Let's conduct a proper robbery this time. A dignified robbery. Krieg laughed maniacally. As the pirates joined in his laughter, they all agreed with Krieg's decision. It was indeed pointless to rely on underhanded methods all the time. A straightforward robbery sounded more exhilarating. When the lookout called out again, sounding shocked, Chief Krieg, someone, someone is running on the water, approaching us at incredible speed. The pirates couldn't help but mock the lookout's words. Have you had too much to drink? How can someone run on water? This is the sea. Don't you understand the sea, one pirate jeered. But the lookout insisted, bastard, I haven't been drinking. I can see clearly. There are four individuals, and they all look exactly the same. And, he's looking at me. Krieg calmly responded, it must be a user of a devil fruit ability. No need to worry, we are the Krieg pirates, the overlords of East Blue. A mere devil fruit user cannot be my equal. These people are just landlubbers and can't possibly defeat us. We'll push him into the sea, and that will be the end of it. Take him out. Understood, Chief Krieg. Chapter 18, Start Action Bam! A gunshot rang out on the boat, grazing Rodney's hair. Scatter! Rodney gave the order, and all the water bodies dispersed, with only one running towards the other pirate ships. Rodney, on the other hand, set his sights on the largest main ship. The opponent had already spotted him, but he evaded a single shot. After that, a dense hail of bullets followed. His Sharingan appeared in his eyes, and the speed of the bullets seemed to slow down in the air. Through the Sharingan, he captured, predicted, and calculated the trajectory of the bullets in his mind. Then his body instinctively reacted and dodged, all in the blink of an eye. Trash. Useless. Shoot him. Turn him into a sieve. Creek roared angrily. Understood. The sweating pirates continued to shoot at Rodney and his water bodies, but unfortunately, 
they were easily evaded. Give me the gun. Frustrated with his crew's ineffectiveness, Krieg grabbed a musket, aimed at Rodney, and started shooting. As the distance closed in, one of the water bodies threw a kunau with an explosive tag attached, plunging it into the pirate ship. What's that? A curious pirate poked his head out from the side of the ship, looking at the kunau. Suddenly, the explosive tag on the kunau burst into flames, causing a powerful explosion. A large hole appeared in the relatively strong hull, allowing seawater to pour into the breached area and flood the cabin. It's bad. The ship is taking on water. Abandoned ship. Abandoned ship. The pirates didn't hesitate and jumped into the sea, swimming towards the other pirate ships. With such a significant breach, repairing the ship was not an option. They had no choice but to abandon it. Boom. 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 Continuous explosions erupted around the fleet as the water bodies swiftly moved. Each time they passed a ship, they placed explosive tags near the sea surface, causing the ship's hulls to rupture and flood with seawater. This forced the pirates to abandon their ships. In this way, a fleet of thousands of people was easily dismantled. The Krieg pirates' biggest advantage was their large numbers, and ships were vital at sea. Without a ship, they couldn't even venture out. The ships in East Blue were not sophisticated vessels built by Water 7. They lacked special equipment and were made of relatively simple materials. For a moment, it looked like dumplings being tossed on the surface of the sea, with human heads bobbing in the water. Rodney didn't care about the life or death of these men. Whether they survived depended on their own abilities. Choosing to be pirates meant they had to accept the risks of dying at sea. They were responsible for their own actions. Captain Krieg. Help us. Let us come aboard, Captain Krieg. I don't want to die yet, Captain Krieg. Please let me aboard. I'm your most loyal subordinate. The pirates desperately wanted to board Krieg's flagship because it was the only ship left. Rodney had blown up all the other dozen or so ships. Krieg was their only chance of survival. Stay down. Stay away from me, you bunch of trash. Where did that damn thing go? Krieg accepted some distressed crew members at first, but he refused to take on those he deemed useless. Instead, he ordered them to stay away and prevented them from coming aboard. Although the ship was large, it couldn't accommodate one or two thousand people. Besides, Rodney would find a way to kill him if there were too many people. It wouldn't be easy to fight in such crowded conditions. As for so-called loyalty, he didn't need it. He didn't trust his crew. Fear and wealth were what governed his crew, not loyalty. Fear was a powerful motivator. As long as the crew feared him, he didn't need anything else. If he ran out of crew members, he could always recruit more. But first, he needed to eliminate the bastard who had severely damaged his fleet. There he is, one of his pirates shouted. Rodney defied gravity, stepping on the almost vertical hull with the agility of a car rising from a coffin. He ran up the hull and stood firmly on the side of the ship. His strange red pupils glanced over the pirates, making many of them feel intimidated. Shoot! Krieg gave the ruthless order, and his men aimed their guns at Rodney and opened fire. The bullets hit Rodney's body, turning him into liquid. Yes, he had turned into a water body. Meanwhile, the real Rodney rushed into the battle from a different direction, accompanied by the remaining two water bodies. Water release! exploding water colliding wave. The sea suddenly surged, and under the powerful waves, many cannon fodder on the deck was washed overboard. Fire release, Phoenix Sage Fire Technique. The Phoenix Sage Fire Technique ignited the sails, rushed into the crowd, and exploded violently, claiming many lives. Seeking death. Krieg's deputy and top thug, Jin, wielded two iron crutches, each with an iron ball at the end that could be lethal to ordinary people. He continuously spun the iron ball crutches, using centrifugal force to increase their destructive power. He charged at the real Rodney with vigor. It wasn't that he saw through Rodney's clone technique, he simply got lucky. Clang! Rodney's wind attribute chakra enhanced his white light chakra saber, increasing its cutting power. When it clashed with the iron ball crutch, sparks flew. If Jin took the time to inspect his weapon, he would have noticed a not too deep cut on the iron ball. White Light Chakra Saber easily parried Jin's attack. Each of his strikes carried immense force, amplified by centrifugal force, far surpassing his own strength. Rodney had no trouble dealing with it. His perception was unparalleled. The Sharingan captured Jin's movements, processed them in Rodney's brain, and predicted his every move. 
With ease, he countered the attacks, using the least amount of effort to neutralize Jin's strikes. It made Jin feel like he was punching cotton his attacks were rendered weak. How is this possible? Is he as strong as the captain? Too, too powerful. Come on, captain. We must kill him. That's right, captain. We are the Krieg Pirates, the strongest pirate group in East Blue. On the side, Rodney sneered and knocked out cannon fodder with a single punch. The strongest? Or just the largest in number? You. The pirates were at a loss for words but continued their assault, attacking blindly. Under their relentless attacks, the two water bodies quickly dissipated, turning into pools of seawater. Only Rodney remained to face Jin alone. Creek squinted his eyes. It was clear that Jin was at a disadvantage. He contemplated whether to intervene. As for whether Jin would get hurt, he didn't really care. From his perspective, the enemy's loss was his gain. However, Jin still held some value to him, so he hesitated for a moment and shouted, Pearl, go and help Jin. Sure thing, chief. A burly figure stepped forward. He wielded two steel shields, each as tall as a person and incredibly thick. He positioned himself between the shields, resembling a sandwich cookie. The shields were adorned with intricate patterns, and a small pearl the size of a watermelon was embedded in the center of each shield. The man also had pearl earrings and a pearl on top of his head. In addition to the two larger shields, he had two smaller shields attached to his hands, elbows, and knees. Pearl the Iron Wall the man with the strongest defense in the Krieg Pirates. Clang! The two shields in Pearl's hands collided with each other, and he laughed, saying, Since you've encountered me, your luck has run out. Rodney thought to himself, Am I playing with pests? He decided to end the battle quickly. Using his Sharingan, he pinpointed the flaws in Jin's movements. The white light chakra saber in his hands refracted the dazzling sunlight, and wind attribute chakra enveloped the blade, creating a thin layer of gold that could crack stones. With a sudden burst of force, he sliced through Jin's iron ball crutch with a single strike. Jin's eyes widened in disbelief, as did the people around him. They witnessed something incredible. At that moment, someone recognized Rodney and exclaimed, I know who he is. He's Joestar J. Rodney, the pirate hunter who's been gaining fame recently. Chapter 19, The Reasons Behind Misfortune I know who he is. The up-and-coming pirate hunter, Joestar J. Rodney. With a smile, he said, Oh, so you know me, that's good. If you don't want to die, put your hands on your head and face the side of the ship. Bang! A wooden stake was left in place as Rodney swiftly approached from behind, slashing with his weapon, white light chakra saber. Regardless of whether they were weak or strong, Rodney always killed his enemies first. Jin was a merciless pirate. Even if his enemies begged for mercy, he would still take their lives. While he valued justice and righteousness, Rodney had no reason to spare him. After wiping the blood off white light chakra saber, a whistling sound filled the air as Pearl fearlessly charged forward, hurling his shield toward Rodney's face. Rodney leaned back, evading the attack. At the same time, he effortlessly attached an explosive tag to the shield before swiftly retreating. Boom! Jin was also affected as he was forced back repeatedly, his ample flesh jiggling from the continuous explosions, feeling as if he were being struck by a heavy hammer. Mr. Jin! Captain! Leader Jin, he, the pirates looked at the lifeless Jin, hoping for some reassurance from him. I see, Jin was useless. Pearl, you deal with him. He can't break through your defense, and I'll provide support, Creek spat disdainfully. He knew Jin would die. He should have used that move to kill him. It's hard to find such a loyal lackey. Understood, Chief Creek. Captain, I am Pearl the Iron Wall, the shield-bearing man of the Creek pirates. Mr. Pearl, at your service. He proudly pounded the two shields he held, creating an unpleasant sound. Iron wall? Not so fast. The quality of your shield isn't bad, but I'll make sure you die here, Rodney replied, a bit surprised that the explosive talisman didn't detonate. Die here? Ha ha ha. Pearl burst into laughter as if he had heard an incredibly funny joke. He raised a finger and said, I've been in 27 battles. Not a single wound not a drop of blood. Even naval artillery shells couldn't harm me. Can you kill me? If you can, I'll eat my shield right now. Rodney countered, you'll all end up dead. How will you eat it? Of course, I won't die. 
you will be the one who dies. With a ferocious expression, Pearl charged forward like a raging bull. However, his weakness was glaringly obvious. While he possessed brute strength, he was merely a brawler, and there was no need to worry too much. Dodging and leaping onto the mast, Creek swiftly assumed a stance. Gun barrels extended from his golden armor, unleashing a barrage of bullets toward Rodney. Danger, danger. Evading once again, Rodney plunged into the midst of the pirates, akin to a tiger among sheep, wreaking havoc on the weaklings. Chaos ensued. Boom. Suddenly, a smoke bomb exploded, sending several pirates flying. One of them landed at Pearl's feet. Pearl felt a sharp pain in his heel and stumbled towards the fallen pirate. The pirate rolled over, stood up, chuckled, and threw another smoke bomb, enveloping the area in a dense fog. Pearl's throat felt cold, and he couldn't stand up anymore. What's happening? Where did that guy go? Creek asked. I don't know. Did Rodney run away? I think I heard Bara scream just now. I heard it too. Where's Pearl? Here, Chief Creek. Pearl. Mr. Pearl, he's dead. Creek noticed a foot still standing on the ground, covered in blood and gruesome. Rodney had disappeared like a ghost, ready to strike at any moment and claim their lives. For a while, everyone was at a loss, unsure of what to do. Creek roared and shot the pirate who had discovered Pearl's lifeless body. The pirate died without knowing why. Perhaps Creek suspected him, or perhaps Creek was merely venting his anger. In any case, he was dead. Prepare yourselves, little ones. Creek removed the golden disc from his shoulders and grasped the mechanism at the back. The front of the disc bore the emblem of the Creek pirates, with a skull that opened its mouth to reveal a small hole. Seeing Creek's posture, the surrounding pirates turned pale with fear. That, that is. MH5. Captain Creek's most terrifying gas weapon. Put on your masks. Where's my mask? Mask. Ah, where's mine? Boss Creek, we're still on board. Yes, boss. Can you give us some encouragement? MH5, the gas bomb prepared by Creek, could fatally poison ordinary people upon inhalation leading to certain death within ten minutes. However, those with stronger bodies would recover after a while, while those with even greater resilience would remain unharmed. Creek sneered, what are you talking about? This is a battle. Those who die are just unfortunate souls. No matter what method I use, I will emerge victorious. Ha ha ha. Once I enter the Grand Line, I'll definitely find the great secret treasure and become the Pirate King. He donned his gas mask and flipped the switch. Thick purple smoke immediately billowed out from the skull's mouth, spreading across the deck. In the darkness, Rodney couldn't help but think that Creed was mentally challenged for resorting to gas bombs. After all, Magellan smoked that stuff as if it were a daily habit and ingested all kinds of highly poisonous substances. Yet he and his subordinates were still fine. It often became a topic associated with the toilet, with chrysanthemums being in full bloom, one. Snatching a mask from a pirate, Rodney affixed it to his face and confidently strode into the poisonous gas, accompanied by white light chakra saber. Ah. Ugh. No, my, ah. Please spare me. Screams echoed within the poisonous gas, causing Creek to retreat in fear. He desperately searched for Rodney's figure beneath his mask but could only catch a glimpse of a fleeting shadow before another pirate fell. This guy, is he toying with me? Playing cat and mouse, perhaps. Once he realized this, Creek roared, completely disregarding the lives of his subordinates. He used the golden disc as a makeshift machine gun, with spikes serving as bullets, shooting indiscriminately. Ah! Leader Creek, why? No. I don't want to die yet. Mom, I want to go home. Wah, wow, the sea is terrifying. In their fright, some jumped off the boat and joined the group of deserters. Today had been too thrilling. The main force of the Krieg pirates had been decimated by a mere handful of people, leaving only their captain, Krieg. As the poisonous mist dissipated, Krieg had already donned a cloak adorned with needles the sword mountain mantle. Holding a blade and wearing a gas mask, Rodney looked at the fully equipped Krieg, tilting his head before throwing a kunau with an attached explosive tag. Boom. The effect was remarkable, sending Krieg flying and shredding his sword mountain cloak into pieces. Krieg's golden armor was also damaged and he sustained multiple wounds. Struggling to get up, he picked up two intact golden discs and fused them together. He pulled out a gun barrel, 
and simultaneously, a sharp gun emerged from the center of the disc. A massive gun. Creek's most powerful weapon, weighing over 2,000 pounds. It caused explosions upon impact, and the greater the swing's force, the more devastating the explosion. Observing Creek in this state, Rodney finally understood why this guy encountered Hawkeye just a week after entering the Grand Line, only to be embarrassingly defeated. Only a few hundred of the original 5,000 crew members remained in his fleet. Such bad luck wasn't a coincidence. What's wrong with him? Did he really think he could be a spearman? Do non-chief combatants think they can handle firearms? Don't underestimate the power of Lucky E. Chapter 20, The Red-Eyed Rodney Creek possessed considerable strength and was considered powerful among ordinary individuals in East Blue. He skillfully wielded his big gun, showing no signs of fatigue. His attacks were forceful and carried explosive power with each strike, though the mechanics behind it remained unclear. Due to Rodney's high attack but low stamina, he couldn't confront Creek head-on. Instead, he fought while retreating, and the cannon fodder group dared not step forward to join the battle. Regarding Creek's cold-blooded behavior earlier, their intentions were clear. They couldn't afford to offer themselves as easy targets, as this guy would kill them without hesitation, leaving them no room to cry. Survival became the top priority. Asshole. If you're brave enough, don't hide. Krieg, unable to catch Rodney, scratched his head in frustration and helplessness. Rodney moved like a nimble monkey, continuously evading his grasp. Not only did Krieg fail to catch him, but the ship's deck was riddled with holes. If this continued, the ship would likely be destroyed. All right. Rodney threw a handful of kunau, each one affixed with an explosive tag. This time, Krieg had improved his skills. He swung his big gun, aiming to strike the kunau directly. Unfortunately, a shuriken intercepted the kunau, altering its trajectory and causing it to land accurately at Krieg's feet. Boom. Once again, Krieg was blown away. His big gun slipped from his grasp and flew off the pirate ship plunging into the ocean, creating a wave that quickly subsided. Krieg, it's over. Rodney swiftly decapitated Krieg in the most efficient manner, leaving behind a headless corpse. He pocketed the head, surveyed the pirates around him, and after a moment's thought, affixed a detonator to one side of the mast. Waving his hand to the group, he smiled and said, Farewell. Whether you survive or not depends on your luck. He somersaulted backward, leaped off the deck, landed on the sea, and calmly strolled on the water's surface, leaving ripples in his wake. Quick, quick, the curse has departed, let's go up. Go up. Those above, throw down the rope. This was the last remaining boat and the only hope for over a thousand people. If they missed it, they would be left with no way out. However, Rodney had other plans. Boom. An explosion occurred, shattering the towering mast. This blast triggered a chain reaction causing successive explosions on the ship. Chaos erupted as pirates were blown apart. Rodney annihilated any hope the pirates had. Once again, the lesson was clear, if one becomes a pirate, they will meet their demise at sea. It was nearly impossible for them to be spared. Evil deeds always come at a price. Ignoring the wails of the survivors, Rodney had completed his mission, and the rewards were officially distributed. Mission, Kill Krieg. Mission Level, C. Status, completed. Rewards, 500, mission points 1 permanent chakra fruit, shadow clone technique, leaf dragon god. Upon consuming the permanent chakra fruit, a portion of the consumed chakra is immediately replenished and increased. Rodney then joined his index finger and middle finger together, crossed his hands into a cross, forming a seal, and exclaimed in a low voice, shadow clone technique. Boom. An exact replica of himself appeared beside him. Rodney instructed the clone to go to another location and run in a different direction. After a while, the shadow clone dissipated, leaving Rodney with the memories it had acquired. It felt peculiar, but it was indeed a method of gaining experience in an unconventional way. This technique was actually developed by the second Hokage and proved to be quite practical. Leaf Dragon God Rotating his body at high speed, Rodney condensed a colossal dragon-shaped whirlwind, stirring up large amounts of seawater. Suddenly, a waterspout emerged from thin air on the sea's surface. The waterspout dissipated, and Rodney stood there. As expected, he was a ninja who had once been hailed as Kanaha's strongest Taijutsu ninja. His Taijutsu skills were impressive. The technique was a ninjutsu created by a ninja from Kanaha. 
Although it was originally from a TV series, it had been incorporated into the system. There were still many unrevealed ninjutsu waiting for Rodney to obtain and utilize. Back on the merchant ship, which continued sailing on the sea, Rodney returned to his room and activated the system. Host, Joestar J. Rodney. Race, Human. Level, Ninja. Attributes, Wind, Fire, Water, Thunder, Earth, Yin, Yang. Ninjutsu, Fire Style, Fire Ball Jutsu, Fire Style, Phoenix Flower Jutsu, Water Release, Water Body, Chakra. Body Arts, Shuriken Jutsu, Shadow of the Dancing Leaf, Leaf Whirlwind. Bloodline Limit, None. Mission Points, 760. After completing missions for several days, Rodney's mission points had accumulated significantly. It was time to exchange them for a new batch of ninjutsu. Ah, his strength could grow once more. Lightning Release, Wave of Inspiration 250, Fire Release, Dragon Fire Technique 200, Water Style, Hand of Waves 300. After all his hard work, he had enough to buy everything he desired. Thunder Dungeon Appreciation Wave could be combined with Water Dungeon to deal double damage. Of course, he needed to remember how to execute it. Fire Dungeon's Dragon Fire Art attacked in a straight line, boasting impressive speed and power. As for instant water, the user releases a wave of water below their feet to act as jets to increase their speed. It allowed for high-speed movement in the water. It's a practical ninjutsu technique. With the Krieg Pirates, the largest pirate group in East Blue, eliminated, Rodney's reputation spread throughout the region. He single-handedly toppled a fleet of thousands, and the three strongest members of the Krieg Pirates fell by his hands. He possessed an unknown Devil Fruit ability, making him an incredibly formidable combatant. Among the remaining pirates, a pair of striking red eyes became a symbol of fear and were associated with demons. Henceforth, the name Red-Eyed Rodney circulated widely throughout East Blue. Rodney. Looking at the newspaper filled with articles about himself, Rodney tore it to pieces. Damn those red-eyed labels. What kind of nonsense was this? Couldn't the East China Sea Press learn from the way the World Economic News presents articles? Couldn't they write something more positive? After all, he was a decent person, wasn't he? What in the world were those red eyes? Finding a place to take a break was a rare occurrence. The newspaper was truly ruining his mood. Those guys were completely off the mark. He didn't care about his own reputation but worried about the nicknames given to him by those groups of people. That's right, if this matter wasn't handled properly, it would stick with him for the rest of his life, and he couldn't let this group of people define him. How about, the copy ninja? No, no, I can't use that name. I'm not the number one technician in Kanaha. The magician Rodney. This name sounds intriguing. Well, let's go with it, he said. TL slash N, kinda cringe, but oh well. He grabbed a pen and paper and swiftly wrote an excellent article. With a quick stroke of the pen, the words appeared on the paper. Then, he found the nearest place to submit it to the East Post Office. Inside, he included a few bellies with a large denomination. It was nothing to him, so he let it go. On the third day, the article he wrote was prominently featured in East Blue's newspaper. Blooming amidst bloodshed, like the flowers at dawn, Joestar J. Rodney, a man who dared to toy with fate. It was a well-written piece that delved into the origin of the nickname, providing personal insights, ahem, reporting truthfully. The name Fate Master quickly spread, surpassing the nickname of Red Eye. Rodney effortlessly resolved the nickname crisis. In other words, he lost a few tickets, but he wasn't short on money. Afterward, he went to claim Creek's bounty and discovered that his worth didn't reach the level of over 10 million bellies. Even if he had a fleet with a significant number of people in East Blue, it still didn't amount to that much. It was probably Smoker and the others who inflated the value. They knew that Krieg had merely gathered a bunch of misfits, right? Since Krieg was too crafty, they couldn't apprehend him in time. So, Rodney gave them a beating, and he didn't need to worry about how many of the gang members survived. He continued with his daily life of completing missions. However, on this particular day, he followed the merchant ship and stopped in front of a sea restaurant. Baratai Restaurant Chapter 21, Baratai Sea Restaurant Baratai renowned as the most famous restaurant in East Blue, bears the name Rose Arbor. Its chef, Red Shoes Zeph, is a pirate who once sailed the Grand Line for a whole year. Due to certain circumstances, 
he lost his most important right foot and returned to East Blue to open this sea restaurant, providing endless delicacies to both merchants and pirates sailing the seas. The restaurant boasts a clean and comfortable environment where guests indulge in their meals. Amongst a group of girls and young women, a young man with blonde hair and curly eyebrows dons a black suit, exhibiting elegant behavior and speaking softly. He can be regarded as a true gentleman. After Rodney took his seat, a waiter promptly approached him, pouring a glass of fresh water and presenting the menu. With a friendly tone, the waiter asked, My guest, what would you like to eat? Rodney opened the menu and ordered, I'll have the sweet and sour sea king tenderloin, braised beef balls, seafood fried rice, rainbow fish sashimi, and any wine will do for me, please. Very well, sir. Please wait a moment, and I'll arrange it for you. However, I must remind you that at Baratai, wasting food is strictly prohibited. Are you sure you can finish your meal? The waiter couldn't help but inquire upon seeing Rodney's figure. At sea, every piece of food is hard-earned, and wastage is not tolerated. Those who waste food are promptly expelled from Bharati restaurant. Don't worry, I can finish it, Rodney replied with a smile. The waiter nodded and refrained from further questions. After taking Rodney's order, he turned and departed. The restaurant's pleasant environment delighted the guests as they relished the delicacies prepared by the chefs. All the chefs in Baratai are eager to show their culinary skills. To them, Baratai holds a special significance. It is a great honor for the chefs to provide delicious food to those sailing the seas and witness their satisfied smiles. Many skilled chefs also perceive the restaurant as an opportunity to challenge themselves and enhance their cooking abilities. Under Chef Zef's guidance, their culinary skills have rapidly improved. Soon after, Rodney's order arrived. The sweet and sour Sea King tenderloin was presented on a large plate, with the Sea King's considerable size making a single piece of tenderloin occupy more than half of the table. This sight did not surprise many since there are numerous hearty eaters in this world. They possess great strength and appetite, making them formidable fighters. Rodney began with the sashimi. Each piece had a consistent thickness and glistened on the plate. He delicately picked up a piece of sea rainbow fish sashimi and savored it. MMM, so good. The taste exploded on his taste buds, prompting the secretion of gastric juices and intensifying his craving for food. He then indulged in a brown beef ball filled with savory soup. MMM, delicious. The beef ball, soaked in soup, burst with a strong umami flavor, providing a refreshing sensation with each bite. Rodney proceeded to cut a piece of tenderloin, its red sauce removing any fishy odor from the Sea King meat. The sweet and sour flavor stimulated his appetite, although it did not have a significant effect. He then took a bite of the seafood fried rice. MMM, this is heavenly. Various seafood ingredients intertwined with the rice, creating an explosion of umami taste that slid down his esophagus into his stomach, satiating his hunger. Satisfied, indeed. Rodney commenced his feast, consuming meat and wine heartily. The experience was immensely gratifying, especially with such delectable food. Although his movements were subtle, the dishes on the table swiftly vanished. Rodney called the waiter, saying, Bring me another serving of the same dishes, excluding the sashimi. Also, bring me three more bottles of wine. Certainly, sir, replied the waiter, no longer questioning Rodney's capacity to eat. Despite consuming a significant amount of food, his stomach only slightly bulged. After engaging in regular exercise, Rodney's physique has been growing, and his food requirements have increased as well. While military rations pill provides the necessary energy, it doesn't stop him from enjoying a good meal. As Rodney chewed his food, it filled his stomach, exerting pressure, and digestion had already begun. Soon, another dish arrived, and Rodney continued eating, patting his now bulging stomach. He expressed his satisfaction, remarking, Ah, that was satisfying. Baratai Sea Restaurant truly lives up to its reputation. I'll pay the bill. The prices at Baratai are reasonable, similar to the cost of using the mutual detonator last time. Contentedly patting his stomach, Rodney purchased a few bottles of wine and tucked them into his pocket. At that moment, a group of menacing individuals stormed into the restaurant. The leader was a one-eyed man, accompanied by his ill-favored subordinates. One of them, known as the Short Winter Melon, one, opened his mouth, revealing a set of decayed teeth, and stuttered, D Don T, move, we're robbing you. A voice from beside the Short Winter Melon shouted loudly, Sea Pirates. The once quiet restaurant suddenly turned chaotic. Helpless merchants, lacking any fighting prowess, 
cowered in fear, further fueling the pirate's arrogance. Ha ha ha. Hand over all your money. And you, kid, call out your chef and give us all your money. I. Before the short winter melon could finish speaking, a leather shoe enlarged before his eyes, kicking him and sending him plunging into the sea with a loud splash. Sanji, with his raised leg and a cigarette in his mouth, spoke up, what was that? I didn't quite hear you. His action caused many girls to scream in admiration. Oh, how handsome he was. Rodney, who was initially about to intervene, witnessed the scene and returned to his seat. It seemed there was no need for him to act. Sanji should be considered the strongest combatant at Baratai, perhaps rivaled only by Zef. Even if that the old man had lost a leg, he still possessed some formidable skills. Let's go. Bring it on. Attack. Charge. Crackling. After a thorough thrashing, Sanji kicked the group out of the restaurant. These individuals were not welcome there, seemingly lacking any respect for food and even frightening the adorable little sisters. Miss Sister. He he he. Sanji's expression fluctuated, lost in his own thoughts. Despite being a perverted cook, he was a gentleman, a knight who would not even attack someone of a third gender, such as a ladyboy, in this world. After dealing with the pirates, Rodney returned to the merchant ship with a bottle of wine. The amount of wine he had was not enough to get him drunk it was simply a refreshing beverage. The next step was to engage in exercise. After all, what would happen if he didn't exercise? Shadow Clone Technique Creating a shadow clone, Rodney engaged in a battle with pure physical skills. Utilizing all the Taijutsu, too, techniques from Naruto, he employed the Rokushiki, ensuring that his main body remained burdened by weight. Throughout the battle, his Sharingan remained active, allowing him to gain double experience and increase his reaction speed. He and his shadow clone fought at sea, closely tailing the merchant ship without falling behind or being detected. Time passed in this manner and they successfully completed an escort mission. Next, Rodney joined another caravan for a reconnaissance mission. The primary objective was to investigate the secret cargo being transported by this particular caravan. Under the cover of darkness, Rodney, transforming into a shadow clone, infiltrated the cabin. Such perilous tasks were best suited for the shadow clone, capable of handling various dangerous assignments. Sneaking into the cabin, the shadow clone effortlessly controlled the guards with Sharingan eventually reaching the innermost section. After surveying the area, Rodney noticed that it was filled with grain and local products. It felt odd it shouldn't be like this. There couldn't be any exceptions, otherwise, the system wouldn't have assigned this task. Could it be? Approaching the grain warehouse, Rodney began pushing aside the grain, eventually discovering a box hidden beneath it. Opening the box, he found it contained brand new firearms. Arm smuggling. These individuals were truly audacious. If their activities were exposed, they would face severe consequences. However, a significant portion of the Marines in East Blue was relatively, corrupt. Arranging the cover-up from top to bottom, disguising the arms beneath the food, and selling them to pirates was not an issue. It would prove to be a lucrative venture. The Shadow Clone disappeared, and within a few days, Smoker received a report from enthusiastic citizens, leading to the detention of the caravan. Chapter 22, The Great Buggy The days of sailing at sea can be long and boring. One needs some entertainment in life. Luckily, there is a book called Ika Ika Paradise by Jiraiya available for purchase in the system mall. Jiraiya's writing style is well known. He risked his life to gather materials and worked hard to complete the book. It became a bestseller, even though it was banned for 18 and below. It's a profound and voluminous work, perfect for passing the time or even using it as toilet paper. However, Rodney finds it uncomfortable to read such novels. The wind and sun at sea can make one's nosebleeds worse, so he usually avoids reading them. On the pirates' side, there are plenty of entertaining novels, such as The Second Generation Pirate King, The Dominating Pirate Falls in Love with Me, and The Future Pirate King. Nine out of ten books are about pirates, and the other one is about the Revolutionary Army. It's unexpected how popular these novels are worldwide. They make people excited and eager to become pirates, defeat Whitebeard, have Kaido as a younger brother, and make Big Mama maid, while facing red-haired Shanks as a pirate wholeheartedly. This desire cannot be contained, and some villagers eventually give up trying to suppress it. It's simply irresistible. Comics aren't Rodney's cup of tea. With a novel covering his face, he lies on a deck chair, 
enjoying his vacation in a beautiful village. The villagers have a simple and honest way of treating people and things, except for the sudden scream. Pirates! The pirates are here. Everyone, hide inside. Does the pirate world never have holidays? Rodney removes the novel from his face and lets out a sigh. The village lacks the means to defend itself, and the people here are not equipped to deal with pirates. Although the pirates aren't particularly fierce or evil, they dress strangely. They resemble a circus more than pirates. The leader of the pirate group, a clown-like figure wearing a captain's hat, red lips and a red nose, along with red striped tights, loose pants and a fluffy red cloak, holds a throwing knife between his fingers and laughs uproariously. Little ones, seize everything for me. All the treasures here belong to us. Gya ha ha ha, seize it. Buggy the Star Clown, a trainee crew member on Pirate King Roger's ship and a friend of red-haired Shanks, ate the split-split fruit and gained the ability to split himself, rendering him immune to slashing. A man whose name and body can merge as he pleases. Buggy, the captain of the Buggy Pirates, possesses the Conqueror's Haki and is one of the four emperors. He has no connection to the world's greatest swordsman, and he won't give a face to anyone, especially those who have eaten the face-face fruit. He is known as the future holder of One Piece. Buggy is always the unpredictable one. This godlike man laughs uproariously, leading his crew to experience life in East Blue. As the saying goes, the small hide in the wilderness, the medium hide in the city, and the large hide in the metropolis. This man has managed to hide in the metropolis, mixing in with the weaklings. He does the work of the weaklings. His bottomless scheming is terrifying, leaving others breathless. But today, someone dares to challenge the gods at the risk of death. In just a face-to-face -face encounter, all the pirates who entered the village were beaten by Rodney. They lay on the ground, groaning or unconscious. Rodney hasn't been injured much since being knocked over by Garp's fist. One can only say that Garp's fist was truly devastating. It still stings when Rodney recalls it. Ninjas are fragile, and as long as they're not injured, they can hold their own. But once injured, they easily fall into a disadvantage. When a magical attack meets a group of fighters and tanks, it becomes a difficult fight. Who? Who dares to strike this buggy? Don't you know who I am? Buggy strikes a pose, pretending to be grand, with a throwing knife in his hand. Rodney looks at him up and down and finds, he's so weak. Can this guy really be buggy? His ability to conceal his strength is impressive. If red-haired Shanks and a trainee from Roger's pirate can make it to the position of the four emperors, then buggy should be capable of the same. Maybe this guy can also hide his strength. Thinking this, Rodney approaches buggy with a quick movement. Shave. Rodney slashes down with a cold blade, splitting buggy in half. However, there's no blood flowing, and the body structure is absent. It's just a red piece rather disgusting. Watching anime is different from reality, to say the least. Continuous swings. Dance of the Camellia. Swish, swish. Buggy is cut into pieces of meat without offering any resistance, floating in the air. His crew isn't surprised, instead, they wear inexplicable smiles. This is their captain, and Buggy's kindness to the challenger is just part of the show. Rodney steps back, and Buggy's laughter emanates from the meat pieces. Gya ha ha ha, I'm immortal. Uncle Buggy can never be killed. Your attacks are ineffective against me. The pieces of meat reform into Buggy's appearance, and his clothes restore themselves. It's a strange ability. Rodney's calm demeanor puzzles Buggy. Shouldn't he be shocked or scared, even crying at this point? Why isn't there any reaction? Buggy feels embarrassed by the situation. Oh, a devil fruit. Why are you so calm about it? In East Blue, there are very few people with devil fruit abilities. It's rare to encounter someone with this ability, so why isn't Rodney surprised? What's so surprising about it? Not only you but I wouldn't even be surprised if someone with a face-face fruit appeared in front of me. What the heck is a face person? A face-face fruit? Of course. Anyone who eats the face-face fruit has to give him face. Rodney confidently asserts. Humph, I bet you'll never see it in your life because you'll be killed by me. Uncle Buggy, right here. Prepare to meet your end. Moji. With a roar, a purple lion approaches, with a ragdoll headgear on its back. Moji, an animal trainer, sits on it, wearing a white plush vest. Attack, Richie. Devour him. Trainer Moji strikes the lion Richie with a small leather whip. Richie's eyes turn red, 
and it lets out a hungry roar as it charges toward Rodney. Boom! After exchanging two punches, both Rodney and Richie are left with big bruises and fall to the ground. Well, who's next? Rodney smiles, not even bothering to draw his saber. These opponents are truly weak. Walking towards Buggy slowly, Buggy shouts, Stay away! Oh, my goodness! Rodney trips and almost falls. What the hell? Was there a stone there? The ground is completely flat. Did he just trip for no reason? This is embarrassing. Good opportunity. Split split cannon. Buggy's hand holding the throwing knife suddenly detaches from his arm and flies towards Rodney at high speed. Rodney quickly turns his head to avoid it, then grabs the hand and steps on it. Ouch. Boy, let go of Uncle Buggy's hand. The pain from his separated body still reaches Bucky, and he cries out. How can this kid react so quickly? Ah! Boy, you're using so much force. Rodney stomps Bucky's hand into the ground with his foot, causing him even more pain. You brat, split split rice cracker. Bucky's lower body separates and spins rapidly, flying towards Rodney like a flying knife. I'll handle it. Ah! The excruciating pain strikes, and Bucky's upper body, floating in the air, can't help but fall to the ground. Then, he looks in Rodney's direction. Buggy's lower body floats in the air, in a strange pose, with his legs twitching. Rodney's foot lands a hit on Bucky's vulnerable spot. A devastating blow. In order to achieve this, Rodney activated his sharing gun. Captain. Captain Buggy. Captain Buggy, hold on. Encouraged by the crew, Buggy overcomes the pain, flies up and angrily exclaims, Boy, I will kill you and feed you to the fish in the sea. Don't kick me, stop kicking stop. Another strike and the great godlike Buggy falls to the ground. Chapter 23, Poor Buggy. Are you dead? Are you dead? He picked up a branch and poked Buggy's red nose. Hey, red nose, big nose, are you awake? Who are you calling red nose? Are you looking for death? Buggy's conditioned reflex kicked in as he heard red nose. He overcame the pain and stood up aggressively. Buggy couldn't hear people calling him a red nose. Even if he were in a severe coma, he would forcefully wake up. The setting is very strange. After a brief moment of anger, reason regained control of Buggy's brain, and the two looked at each other. Rodney, underscore underscore. Buggy, underscore number. The atmosphere suddenly quieted down, and the scene became very embarrassing. Let's stop fighting and make an emergency escape. Buggy's body suddenly turned into dozens of pieces, scattering in all directions. The pieces didn't fly far before reforming into a body in the woods, floating in the air, but missing two feet. My feet. Buggy saw through the gaps in the leaves that his own feet were trapped under Rodney's. Now it's troublesome. Buggy's ability to tear apart his body is considered a weakness when it comes to his feet. He can't fly, and his body can't be too far away from his feet. Humph, fortunately. My uncle's ability is invincible here. Being immune to slashing, Buggy doesn't have to worry about what will happen to his feet. Now he just needs to find a way to retrieve his feet and save his crew members. Although he often bullies his crew members, Buggy still cares about them. On Rodney's side, Rodney looked at the two feet he was stepping on and smiled. Knowing that cutting would be useless against him, he didn't choose to use ninjutsu again. He pointed at the remaining crew members and said, Bring the unconscious person back to the boat and then. Looking back at Buggy in the woods, he smiled unfriendly in Buggy's eyes. What the hell is this guy up to? Buggy hasn't remembered the information about Rodney yet, but he knows that this guy is not someone to mess with. So he decides to wait and see. Under Rodney's threat, Buggy's crew obediently carried the group of unconscious guys onto their pirate ship. As for Buggy's two feet still being stepped on by Rodney, it was obvious that Rodney wasn't going to let him go. This annoyed Bucky for a while. How long are you going to keep me trampled on? It feels very uncomfortable to be stepped on. At this moment, Rodney moved, kicking Buggy's feet one by one until he kicked them onto the pirate ship. Not good. Wait, Buggy couldn't control his body, and he flew along with his feet. Any part of his body could go missing, but his feet had to be there. Start the boat, said Rodney. Afraid of Rodney's power, the pirates had to set sail. They cursed inwardly but didn't dare to show anything on the surface. Buggy was left hanging behind the boat. While Rodney wasn't paying attention, he quietly boarded the boat. What's going on now? 
Buggy asked one of the crew members on the ship. I don't know, Captain. This guy wants us to sail to the nearest naval branch. What should we do, Captain Buggy, the crew member asked. The peak combat power of the entire Buggy Pirates is Buggy, as he is a Devil Fruit user. In East Blue, there are very few guys with Devil Fruits. They have always listened to their boss. Buggy pondered for a while and said, let me think about it, but first you need to retrieve this uncle's feet. He must get his feet back, otherwise, his ability will be limited. Is this it, a hand passed over two feet from one side. Buggy took them without even thinking and said with a smile, yeah, that's right. You did a good job, kid. I'll make you one of my crew, he put the feet on and smiled with a pair of red eyes. Buggy, X. Hello, Captain Buggy. Kid, you, those eyes, I remember. You're the recently famous pirate hunter, Red-Eyed Rodney. Buggy shouted the nickname that Rodney didn't want to admit. You bastard, have you already set your sights on me? Damn it. Veins popped up on Rodney's forehead, but he still wore a smile on his face. Captain Buggy, call me Fate Master Rodney. I didn't intend to catch you, but now it seems I'll be sending all of you to Logetown, the town of beginnings and ends. It's very suitable for you, isn't it? Buggy's body trembled, cold sweat dripped from his forehead, and he said, You. Could it be that you? Oh, I have a special intelligence system, and I know your identity very well. You. What do you want? Revealing the crew's identity as members of Roger's pirate could attract the marines, and his ability is no match for them. Rodney smiled slightly. That's for me to know. He punched Buggy, knocking him to the ground. Buggy, who was about to use his ability to split his body, suddenly felt a chill in his wrist. Then his whole body became weak, and he fell limp on the ground. This. Could this be? Well, those are seized home cuffs. Don't even think about escaping. I'll send you all to Logetown one by one, Rodney declared. He glanced at the crew member who was eating melons and said, What are you staring at? Why aren't you sailing? If you don't set sail, I'll toss you into the sea to feed the sea kings. Yes, yes. The crew hurriedly went about their tasks. Well, the scenery here is quite pleasant. You can just stay here, Rodney said as he turned his back to Buggy. Although Buggy's body was weakened, it didn't mean he had no backup plan. Seeing Rodney with his back turned, Buggy seized the opportunity and activated his special Buggy Balls. A tiny cannonball shot out from the solace of Bucky's feet, hurtling towards Rodney at high speed. Reacting quickly, Rodney turned around and unsheathed white light chakra saber, infusing it with thunder attribute chakra. He sliced through the special Buggy Balls with his blade. Boom. Even though Rodney managed to cut it, the special Buggy Balls still exploded. The powerful blast sent him flying away. Buggy couldn't help but burst into laughter. Gyahaha. After eating a special buggy ball from Uncle Buggy, you're definitely finished, right? Rodney's body was flung out of the pirate ship, but instead of plunging into the deep sea as Buggy had expected, he landed on the water's surface like a floating stone. He stepped on the water, coming to a stop. His clothes were tattered, his skin was burned in many places, his face was covered in soot, and some of his hair had been singed. Buggy, degree? Degree? This monster. How can he still be alive after taking a special buggy ball from Uncle Buggy? Rodney? Underscore. With bloodshot eyes, Rodney watched as Buggy felt that his life was hanging by a thread. What should he do now? Should he prepare to meet Captain Roger? No, he hadn't found the treasures yet. He regretted using the special buggy ball on Rodney. Well done. You're quite something, Buggy. Rodney gritted his teeth. He was in pain but he activated his medical chakra, causing his palm to emit a cooling light that stimulated cell recovery and helped heal his wounds. What? What do you want? Don't come any closer. Buggy kept retreating, but Rodney caught him and pulled out a steel wire from his pocket. One end of the wire was attached to the sea stone cuffs, while the other end was tied to the railing on the ship. Wait, you didn't mean to. That's exactly what you thought. Buggy was kicked off the pirate ship by Rodney and dragged along in the water by the ship. Gilyalu. Hold on. Gilyalu, Buggy was dragged by the ship, floating on the sea's surface for a while, sinking in at times. He felt powerless as he couldn't use his abilities, and he felt greatly aggrieved. Keep an eye on him every half an hour. This guy can't die. 
If you neglect your duty or if I find out you've brought him back up, you'll suffer the same fate, Rodney commanded the group of pirates beside him. He laughed, sending shivers down their spines. Understood. Poor Captain Buggy, he would have to endure it for now. Thus, Buggy spent his days in the sea, eating, sleeping, and enduring, as an ordinary person might perish under such conditions. Rodney had been careless this time, he didn't expect Buggy to have such a secret attack, and it was painful to endure. It took him days to heal the burns on his body, but regrowing his hair would take more time. Chapter 24 No Longer a Ninja, But a Meat Shield In Loke Town, with two cigars in his mouth, Rodney stared at Smoker who had apprehended the Buggy Pirates. Although he had managed to bring Buggy to justice, he tricked Smoker into taking away the valuable sea stone cuffs. What's with that look, Captain Smoker? I'm not a pretty lady. It makes me shy when you stare at me like that. Besides, I like women, Rodney said, sensing Smoker's gaze and quickly stepping back while crossing his arms over his chest. Angrily, Smoker clenched his fists and retorted, You bastard. If you spout nonsense again, I'll kill you. Are you brave enough to arrest me? Rodney taunted. What? You took away our sea stone cuffs, and I haven't settled the score with you yet. Smoker exclaimed. Oh, those have already been returned to Vice Admiral Garp, Rodney casually remarked. Ha, as if the strategic resource of sea stone cuffs would be returned to him. They were rare in East Blue. Did you take them for yourself, kid? How could I be that kind of person? Don't underestimate me. I aspire to be a partner of justice. Rodney replied confidently. Smoker sneered in disbelief and said, Just you? A partner of justice. What? You don't believe me? No. Oh, Mr. Smoker and Mr. Rodney seem to be on good terms, Tashiji chimed in with a smile, oblivious to the tense atmosphere between the two. He he he, Rodney chuckled. Then he remembered something and looked at Tashiji, asking, Master Chief Petty Officer Tashiji, what about my bounty? Buggy had a bounty of over 10 million bellies, which could buy a lot of things. Here it is. Please keep it, Tashiji replied, taking the bounty bag from her subordinates and handing it to Rodney. They didn't bother counting it. Smoker and Tashiji wouldn't pocket the money for themselves. All right, since Buggy is now in your custody, my business here is done. After taking the money, Rodney turned to leave. There was nothing else worth his attention. But then he remembered something and asked, Have you repaired the houses that were destroyed when I captured Ace last time? Tashiji replied, Yes, they've almost been repaired. We'll be back in business soon. That's good. After pondering for a moment, Rodney took out a handful of bellies from his bag and threw it to Tashiji, saying, Consider it an apology for last time. It may not be much, but let it cover some expenses. Let everyone have a good meal. Oh? But the Marines have already compensated us. No, this is my personal apology. As they discussed, Smoker interjected, Why did Fire Fist Ace end up at the Grand Line? Rodney, shouldn't you explain that? Ace had become the most prominent figure at the Grand Line, and there were few pirates at his level. With his exceptional physical abilities, incredible devil fruit power, and strong crew, he was virtually unmatched in the first half of the Grand Line. Oh? That. Don't ask me. You can ask Vice Admiral Garp, Rodney quickly shifted the blame to Garp. Didn't you promise that nothing would happen? Oh? Did I? You guys seem to need a reminder of what happened back then, Smoker said, placing his hands on his back. He he he, I've already said it all. It has nothing to do with me. If you keep going like this, be careful I might sue you for defamation and disturbing the citizens, Rodney warned with a smirk. Humph, I'm part of the Marine. Smoker exhaled a puff of white smoke. Those who knew him might mistake him for a pirate. Forget it, let's not dwell on this. The matter with Fire Fist Ace has nothing to do with me. Maybe the old man just loves his grandson, Rodney shrugged, completely disengaging himself from the conversation. I don't care about their melons in the rain, one. Ding. A new task arrived. Excuse me, I need to use the restroom. Please excuse me, Rodney smiled mischievously and then turned and left. The Chunin exams are now open. Will you accept the challenge? If you accept, it will begin immediately. If you decline, you'll have to wait for a year before trying again. Oh. The Chunin exam? 
Is this the start of the Chunin exam? Isn't it a bit sudden? It caught me off guard. It's been almost a year since I became a Genin, and becoming a Chunin in just one year seems a bit rushed. Wait, I don't want to leave this realm of invincibility just yet. Thinking about the ninja battles in Kanaha, they're a bunch of bullies who wreak havoc. Then there are the upper level ninja battles in Kanaha, clanging pots and pans like a joke. I don't want to be promoted just yet. The Chunin exams may have caught me off guard, but when the time comes, the promotion will naturally happen. I'll make sure to accept the Chunin exam on the system panel. Ding! The host has accepted the Chunin exam. The task will begin immediately. The Chunin exam task, hunt our long pirates. Task level, C+. Task reward, obtain, fragmented, Katsuyu, strength of a hundred seal, creation rebirth, chakra control, 1000 mission points. Hiss. Rodney gasped when he saw the generous rewards. Katsuyu is the personal summon of Hokage Tsunade, one of Kanaha's legendary gambling addicts. Although its combat abilities are average, it possesses powerful medical capabilities. It can heal injuries by absorbing a sufficient amount of chakra from the user. Moreover, the slug is quite large. Unlike the toads in Mount Mai, Boku and the snakes in Ri, Chi Cave that live in colonies, the slug is a single entity. All the slugs that emerge are its avatars, and it's rare for someone to summon all of them. Strength of a hundred seal involves injecting a large amount of chakra into the yin seal on the forehead. When needed, the seal is untied, allowing the stored chakra to be freely used. This enables the user to perform ninjutsu and forbidden techniques that require a significant amount of chakra. It can also enhance physical skills and serve as group therapy when combined with the slugs. This allows for continuous healing during battles, improving the user's overall abilities. Overall, it serves as a hidden reserve of energy, accumulating power over time and unleashing it when necessary to achieve a burst of immense strength and comprehensive enhancements. Additionally, the technique can bring about beauty and eternal youth a dream come true for countless girls. Tsunade truly lives up to her name. As for creation and regeneration. Honestly, Rodney wasn't too eager to have it. While it's exceptional medical ninjutsu that allows for the rapid healing of wounds and even internal organ injuries, it comes at the cost of reducing one's lifespan. Creation and regeneration stimulate the body's cells through chakra, accelerating cell division and facilitating rapid wound recovery. However, there is a limit to the body's cell recovery, and accelerated cell division actually shortens one's lifespan. Chakra control is a highly practical skill. The user can precisely control the chakra, concentrating it throughout their entire body and unleashing tremendous power. This skill is mastered by individuals like the first and second Hokage, Tsunade, and Sakura. Well, it truly is a practical skill. With this ability, Rodney's power can be significantly enhanced. In a world filled with formidable opponents, his own power is still insufficient. I want to become a sturdy shield. In the world of pirates, it's better to have some meat on your bones. Not everyone can be like Gandalf, relying solely on magic. If melee ability is lacking, just throw in a lightning spell. The neighboring world of fate has perfect examples. Merlin recites incantations, excelling in swordsmanship and surpassing the Knights of the Round Table. He is known as the Sword Master of Avalon. Siegfried wields a magic wand, replacing magic with brute force, and then uses his axe to cleave through his enemies. Iskander, the King of Conquerors, Gilda Rice, Master of Majestic Magic. Solomon, who relies on his ten rings to boost his powers and make him invincible. These excellent role models are right in front of me. How can I not learn from them? Fully enhance melee abilities, restore health, replenish mana, and apply various buffs, then go all out in close combat. As everyone knows, the true romance of a man is to fight with his fists, as a high damage but fragile character has no future. Rodney, I've learned a valuable lesson during my short time as a ninja. The more one learns about ninjutsu, the more one realizes its limitations. Ninjutsu has its bounds. System, what are you trying to say? Rodney, I no longer want to be just a ninja. I want to surpass the limits of a ninja. I want to become a meat shield. Chapter 25, Nami, the Cat Burglar Nami lost her parents to pirates at a very young age. She was taken in by two sisters who raised her as their own, and they lived happily as a family of three. However, their peaceful life was shattered when the Arlong pirates invaded Kokoyasi village, where Nami lived. The pirates took over the village and established their Arlong park, 
dominating the entire East Blue. The leader of the Arlong Pirates, Arlong, killed Nami's adoptive mother and imposed a monthly payment on the villagers as a form of tribute. Nami's once happy life was destroyed. Later, Arlong noticed Nami's talent for drawing nautical charts and used it as leverage to force her to work for him. They made an agreement that she could buy back the village and her freedom if she collected 100 million bellies. Thus, Nami began life as a thief, earning her the reputation of the cat burglar. Her stealing skills were unmatched in East Blue, except for phantom thief Karina. Her goal was to gather 100 million bellies to save everyone. She firmly believed it was possible. However, Arlong was incredibly powerful, and he had connections with the chief of the nearby marine branch. Even the marines' attempts to attack them were thwarted, with their ships sinking into the sea. The mermen in East Blue had stronger bodies than humans, and there were few humans who could rival Arlong's power. This left Nami feeling desperate, and she had no choice but to abide by the rules set by Arlong and herself. She knew there was only one path she could take. She was well aware of the high possibility of being deceived, but it was her only hope. She couldn't give up. Even if there was only a glimmer of hope, she was willing to try. Slapping her cheek, she said, Come on, Nami. We still have 23 million to go, and we can gather 100 million bellies to buy everyone back from Arlong. Although she is at the age of being a high school student from Earth, her body had developed well. It seemed that the nutrition in this world was better. Wearing the attire of a merchant ship attendant, she boarded a merchant ship, assuming the owner of the ship was wealthy. With this in mind, she took light steps, pushing a food cart and heading towards the finest rooms on the ship. Since she had boarded the ship under the cover of darkness, she didn't know which room belonged to the captain, but it didn't matter. The people living in such rooms were undoubtedly wealthy. She gently knocked on one of the doors, and a gentle voice responded, Who is it? Supper has been delivered from the ship's galley, sir. Would you like some? Nami asked politely. Snack? I'm feeling hungry. Thank you for your trouble, the voice replied. Footsteps followed, and the door opened to reveal a young man with tan skin and long, dark hair cascading behind his head. His handsome face appeared soft in the dim light of the cabin. Please come in, Rodney said, sweeping his eyes over Nami's face and welcoming her inside. Something felt off about this woman, Rodney thought to himself. He was passing by Kokoyasi village with the ship and figured he could take on a mission while he was there. However, he didn't expect to encounter pirates but a petty thief instead. Nami pushed the food cart in and quickly glanced around the room. She focused on the pouch on the bed belonging to Rodney and then turned to him with a smile, asking, Sir, what kind of food would you like to eat? The food from the galley was quite good, and it came with a side of red wine. Unbeknownst to Rodney, Nami had already laced the wine and food with drugs. Once he consumed them, she would be able to steal his treasures. Thank you, Rodney said as he sat down to enjoy the food. Although it didn't compare to Sanji's dishes, it was still quite tasty. After all, not everyone could match the skills of the chef at Baratai. Rodney devoured the food quickly, drinking a bottle of red wine like a thirsty man. Yawning, he said, please close the door when you leave. I'm feeling sleepy. Of course, sir, Nami replied with a smile. She pushed the food cart away and closed the door behind her. Standing outside the door, she pressed her ear against it, listening for any sounds coming from the room. Soon enough, as she expected, the sound of peaceful sleep emanated from within, indicating that the person inside was fast asleep. With a smile, Nami easily pushed open the door. In the darkness, she relied on the moonlight filtering through the porthole to navigate the room and approached Rodney's bedside. Her fair and tender hand reached out for the pouch on the bed. It's easy to grab it, hey? But why does it feel like something is tugging on the bag? Feeling an odd sensation, Nami's instincts told her that something was amiss. She was about to let go when a dagger-like object shot out from the shadow across the room. It sliced through the air with a strong gust, narrowly missing Nami's beautiful cheek. This, a knife? So close. However, Nami, the little burglar, wouldn't be so easily fooled. Nami was quite pleased with herself, thinking that she had narrowly escaped the trap. Little did she know, there was another pull, and several kunao flew out from the opposite shadow. This time, they were different from before, their ends were tied with steel wires. The steel wires formed a net that tightened around Nami, binding her tightly and causing her to fall to the ground in an unfavorable position. What? This is so tight. What is this? 
Nami whispered, struggling to free herself. However, the more she struggled, the tighter the steel wire became. It constricted her chest, making it difficult to breathe. What was happening? Oh? It seems you've triggered my trap, Miss Snitch, Rodney said with a smile as he sat up on the bed. He was wide awake, showing no signs of sleepiness. You, you saw through my trick? Nami asked. Of course. I'm used to dealing with tricks and even having an antidote for drugs. Let me tell you, drugs like those are best mixed with hard liquor. This kind of food and red wine are easy to consume, and the drugs still have a faint taste, Rodney explained, grinning. Nami. Meeting an expert was truly unfortunate. Wearing a pitiful expression, she pleaded, I'm sorry, sir. It's my first time doing something like this. I had no choice but to resort to it for my livelihood. Please let me go. I have a family to support, and if the captain finds out, I'll lose this job. Rodney put away the useless steel wire and slipped it into his pocket. He said, Miss Snitch, do you think I'll believe your nonsense? Leaning forward, he sniffed the air. This smell, it's the scent of lies. You're lying. Nami. You can smell lies. What do you have a nose of truth or something? Can lies really have a scent? What kind of joke is this? Humph, you don't believe me? Did you, cough cough, anyway, you're lying. Miss Snitch, you seem to be a repeat offender. So I won't show you any mercy, Rodney said, revealing a cold glint as he unsheathed White Fang. Nami hurriedly exclaimed, wait. Please. Let me go. I can lead you to a hidden treasure of a pirate group. Rodney paused, intrigued by the mention of treasure. The temptation was strong. Well, you've managed to capture my interest, Miss Snitch. I do have a great interest in treasure. Very well, what's your name? Rodney asked. Nami. Is there a problem? Nami replied. A big problem.